All right. Uh, we're going to be uh, presenting a final speaker. And uh, what can I say about him? Uh, even though I've, I've met him seven, eight years ago, it's like we've known each other for forever. And uh, some of the things that we've been through, court cases, uh, things taking, taking place at the international level, uh, I, I, I cannot say enough about him. Dr. Kerosai has uh, really changed the vocabulary that we're now speaking here in Hawaii. And as a result of his research, and more so, especially before he even got his uh, doctor's degree at University of Hawaii, what was so amazing is that he was all already at the Perfect Court of Arbitration uh, in 1999, and he only had his bachelor's degree and taking a case to the Perfect Court of Arbitration. And it wasn't until after, and that was a landmark case that took place because it, it affects everything that we're doing today. Because that case put the Hawaiian Kingdom back on the map. At the, because of the Permanent Court of Arbitration's recognition that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist and accepted the case in that court. And he only had a bachelor's degree. And a good part that I can take credit for, he went to Kamehameha. You know, he was a Kamehameha graduate and he went to Kamehameha. You know, and so as an upperclassman, I shouldn't mind him following my footsteps. You know, and from that point, you know, how we met, and I tell this story a lot. Is that uh, uh, Aha Kanaka was involved in a contested case hearing in a proposed massive large fish market over on the Kohala coast. And it was uh, these venture capitalists from Hawaii, uh, from America, who came to Hawaii because Hawaii does not have any laws that prevents fish farms to be built in its waters. All the other states in America, it's illegal to have fish farms. So they found a green light to bring fish farms to Hawaii. And so this, the guy that was leading the charge, this was his vision of Hawaii, that he was going to make Hawaii the Silicon Valley of fish farms. <laughs> Seriously. And these guys had millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they were going to do a uh, domino effect going around to the different islands and building fish farms. The fish farms that they were building was highly toxic. The kind of fish, especially salmon, was morphing into what we call frankenfish. And the kind of food that they were using was coming from China with tainted poison. And all of this, the fish farm that they were proposing at uh, off the Kohala Coast was going to be for pelagic fish. What that is, is a big fish, the ahi and the bluefin. And the proposal was to have 12 fish cages the size of the one fish cage was going to be about 10 times the size of this where we're sitting now. That's, what's, that's one fish uh, cage. And they were going to be getting over 400 acres of ocean off the Kohala coast. And what that meant was that they were going to be intruding on all of the Hawaiian fish crops. And so it was going to be uh, off limits for Hawaiians to go to their traditional fishing grounds to go fishing. So we had to step up. And so they proposed before the Department of Land and Natural Resources to get the permit. And DLNR granted the permit. 
And so this is where we found the Contessa case. It was a legal issue. And once I filed it, then I went over. Not one. Because I wasn't an, uh, an attorney. You know, I didn't know anything legal except that. I know I knew it was wrong. But now what I do to find legal help in order to go up against these guys. So I met with all of my activist friends all over the place here on the island. And everybody was coming up with all these ideas of how we were going to, uh, to approach it legally. But all of their approach was just really weird. And I had to sit back and go, like, hey, that's not to work. But the name that kept surfacing, you know, in all my activist friends, oh, it's Kelly Sight. Kelly Sight. And I said, well, who is this guy? And everybody said, oh, we don't know. But Kelly Sight might know, you know, how, how to approach this. And I said, well, how would he know? Oh, I don't know, I heard him went, went to UH on Guam, and his name kept coming up. So I finally got on the internet, and I googled his name, and uh, his dissertation came up. And I started reading his dissertation, and all the questions that I've always had in regards to being a Hawaiian, Hawaiian history, Hawaiian politics, and so forth, was answered when I read his dissertation. Nobody else had, had really explained it in that depth and, and understanding. I talked with Ron Bumpy, I talked with Skippy, I talked with Tom Anthony, all those guys, and Hobby Kili you know, and but it didn't, you know, it from it didn't 1841. So, finally, after reading his dissertation, he was going to be speaking at UH the following week. So I jumped on the plane, flew over, and I said, I gotta meet this guy. So I parked my car up at the Hawaiian Studies Department up at UH. And as I was coming out of the parking lot, who should be walking along the sidewalk? Was the other side. And so I had to make it look like I knew him. You know, so I, I ran out of my, my parking lot. And I was like, get out of the now! And he was looking at me like, oh. you know, who is this guy? And I ran up to him and I went, oh, that was the wrong approach because maybe he was thinking that I was trying to attack him. You know, so I introduced myself and I said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I need your help because I read your dissertation. And I quickly explained to him that I had a contested case hearing before the R. And so he said, oh, come, walk with me as we walk down to where he was going to be speaking. And by the time we got down there to where he was speaking, he said, yeah, I'll help you. And that was the beginning of our relationship that I really, really uh, embraced and resonated because he has taught me so much of what it is to be a Hawaiian and to stand up and also be counted and to make sure that we have an allegiance to our Hawaiian kingdom and our government. I'd like to introduce you to my friend and my educator and lower class man, the other side. I thought Kali was one of the speakers. That's what I say. Hey, open up for questions and answers. <laughs> just learning from you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, a lot of things are happening. Um, I want to kind of touch on all these things, but it's all starting to come to a head. Before you can understand it coming to a head, you need to understand what actually happened. Because if you just look at what's happening now, it's kind of puzzling. It's like, wait, wait, what, what? Well, I can assure you that what happened to change the mindset of people in the early 1900s was hijacking the educational system. Things are changing now because we are now taking control back in the educational system. So what you folks uh, saw here 
were actually PhDs and uh, masters, actually a PhDs and a PhD candidate that actually have done their research. Right? Now, when you do research at the University of Hawaii, as you do research in any university system, you don't argue your research. You don't try to convince people that this is what it is. That's political. That's what is called rhetoric. Rhetoric is the art of convincing. Okay? In the academy, what it is, is called falsification. Falsification is a scientific approach of where you present research, you have to defend it. You don't argue it. And the role of your committee, doctoral committee or the master's committee, is to poke holes into that research, not in the way you're delivering it. So it's a matter of falsification. You falsify information. Okay? And that's very important for everybody to know because a lot of people don't really understand how the university system operates. People don't go up there and take classes to learn how to argue. Actually, you can. There's actually classes on rhetoric, the art of convincing, the art of getting people to change their mind, uh, argumentative writing. But when you do research, though, that is not argument. That is defense. So when you defend your dissertation against the prodding of your committee members, and you can't shore it up, you don't get your PhD or you don't get your master's. That's how it works. Okay. So people that you've heard already that came up here have gone through that process. Now the university also encourages amongst its faculty and, 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 and staff, if they have a research degree called a master's or PhD, is to also get uh, articles published. And articles are called peer review, or if it's a law article, law review. And it goes to that same process of the editor poking holes in it. And once they cannot poke any more holes, then they publish it. So that's a process, again, that speaks to the university style across the world on how information is brought up. Now once research has been done, articles have been written, you can't stop somebody who read the article and then they try to use it in a particular way. That's fine. But as far as the ones who wrote the article, they have gone through that process called analytical rigor. And it's not easy to go through that process. I'll tell you one thing. One thing that Native Hawaiians might have a problem with when they come to the University of Hawaii is getting critiqued. Yeah, you know how I ends up. What? <laughs> Short rolls <bowls> already. Because <laughs> you're questioning what they said. But at the university system, you have to learn how to take critique because that's how you better yourself and broaden your, broadening your horizon. For me, I learned how to take critique called after action review. Served in the military. I was an officer. You go through after action reviews when you do a battle exercise and you don't get personal over it. You're glad they're finding holes in what you did and you shore that up so that when you do get into a real fight, you're not going to die. So I've learned through the military system how to take critique. That's not a problem. So I was a perfect fit right into the university system. But I saw some Native Hawaiians that were some of my friends that came through. Oh, sometimes the lecture rules with the professor. Hey, honey, take it easy. All he's doing is, or she is pointing out something to you, deal with it, right? And that's what we also do at the university system, is encourage not just Native Hawaiians or Hawaiian subjects, but also any student to go further and start asking the right questions, right? Don't debate, inquire, right? When you know that you got your stuff down, okay, then you go and debate. But until then, we have to learn how this system operates. And what is amazing is that the educational system in the Hawaiian Kingdom was profound. I actually wrote a, a short article in the National Education Association, the NEA that uh, Jennifer referenced. That is the largest uh, union of school teachers across America. It was one of my articles that spoke to education in the kingdom. And education in the kingdom was, was like God's word. You say it, it's like, oh, dead serious stuff. Hawaiian government, as far as appropriation, never planned up on funding. Kind of an ironic thing today. Huh? Back then, there was actually a direct tax called school tax that you pay. And education was there from grades one through eight. And then you also had what was called, not high schools, back in the Kingdom area, you had colleges. Did you know St. Louis used to be called St. Louis College? Iolani used to be called Iolani College. For the whole, the other school was called Oahu College. Okay? Cutting edge stuff. Uh, literacy. 
amongst the population was nearly universal. Everyone could read and write. So you didn't have to go around and tell people what's going on. Newspapers were prevalent all over the country, and that's where you learned what was happening. So it, I remember reading an article written by a, a visiting reporter. I think it was in 1898, 1897. He said he was in Waikiki and he was walking past a hale, right, fishing hale, and everybody's in the hale reading newspapers. Yeah, he was reading newspapers. It was almost like that was the time out. You know, take power, money, fish, the way to read the papers. And that is where the world opened up to Hawaii in the 19th century. Remember, there were no televisions back then. You know? There were no documentaries. There, were, there was no CNN. Hawaiians didn't know what an elephant was. But when they saw the picture of an elephant in the newspaper, they went, wow. And then when they see something going, horse, right? Look at one dog, huh? Elio. Guess what they named him? Leo, the big dog. <laughs> you know, so it's it's amazing when you go back into the history that all of us had the privilege of going through because we do the research and you find these things and they're like gems and you're like, wow. Because for myself, when I talk about the country called the Hawaiian Kingdom, I'm not talking about a sovereignty group. I'm talking about a country that my great-grandparents were born into. My great-grandparents were born in the 1880s. They were born into a country called the Hawaiian Kingdom. And I think today you heard research that spoke to that country. And it presented a very different picture than others may, may have heard. Yeah. Something new, or others might have said, yeah, I'm starting to learn that as well. So it's that country that I'm talking about. But when we talk about today, we assume this is the state of Hawaii. But nobody knows where the state of Hawaii came from. Uh, Jennifer Rogers brought that point up. She heard of how Hawaii became a part of the United States. Somehow people voted, but she didn't know about it. She didn't know about what people were saying as far as an occupation, right? Or an illegal overthrow. Now, when I say overthrow, what was overthrown? You know, that's a follow-up question. Was it the country that was overthrown, or was it the government that was overthrown? So these kind of things play into how you answer the question, as well as how you frame the question. Because many times you might be asking the wrong questions. I can say today that we've been led to believe that we're playing a baseball game and everybody's using baseball rules. What if I can prove to you that we're not even in a game of baseball, we're in a game of football. And we've been using baseball rules to play a football game. What you folks are learning here is the game of, the game of football and the rules. And once you abide by the rules, you can come up with all kind of plays. And that's what I want to share with you today. Okay? So with that, I want to thank the uh, Kiriho Malu Poana for providing the venue, my, my wife's Poana. Um, also, uh, the Kanaka Council for the Island for putting it on. And also, uh, acknowledge all my friends from UH who came over, because now I live on a big island, so after we're going to get together, talk story. You know one thing that one of the uh, academics who teaches honors history at Kumeme um, schools, Umi Perkins, he owes a lot of his understanding and, and, and getting this new information by spending time at Manoa Gardens. Anybody know what Manoa Gardens is? At the University of Hawaii, Manoa Gardens is the bar. <laughs> and that is where all the academics will get together and they start to talk. Well, we don't go there like a regular bar. We actually go there to talk with beer. Yeah, meaning nobody falls over, nobody screaming. <laughs> we actually engage in this stuff. And did you know that that is, uh, that is also what they do in, in England, in Great Britain? The pubs, you guys ever heard of the pubs? Yeah, pubs on campus. That's where a lot of the academics go to discuss these kind of issues. So, Uwe Perkins actually made that point in one of his papers, I believe, or... Did you guys remember that? Uh, oh, it was Donovan, my bad. Donovan Prezzo was the one who said that, not Uwe Perkins, but Uwe was there at Monroe Gardens as well. But Uwe don't drink. <laughs> Speaking of soda. <laughs> okay, so what I want to share with you today is I want to bring you from now to then and back to now. 
And we're basically going to go through what is called Back to the Future. Okay? Kavama Hope and Kali Brachela. The word for future in the Hawaiian language is Kavama Hope. Va is short for manava, which is time. Mahope is backwards. Mamua is forward. So when you tell a Hawaiian, look to the future, they look to the past. They don't argue the future, they explain the past. Because in the past is the mo'olelo, the stories that have happened. And these mo'olelo, once you understand it, will give you what is called ike. Now you have an idea of what's going on. You can see something you didn't see before. And within that ike, you pick what is your kuleana. Now what? What do I do? A lot of us here picked our kuleana, academics. But for me, I got a few kulianas beyond the academic kuleana. I want to share some things that I've been involved with and I continue to be involved with, but it's all based on the mo'olero, on the history, yeah, and bringing that forward. So remember, the practical value of history is that it's a film of the past run through the projector of today onto the screen of tomorrow. Okay? That film never changes, but your projector has to get updated. Once you update your projector, now you can see something. And, and sometimes it might be scary, but it's real. And how you deal with something being, when you're scared, get more information. Yeah? Don't let fear control you. Let you control fear. And all fear is telling you, you don't have enough information in it to process. Get more information. In the Army, we call that intel. Before you come up with a battle plan, get intel. Because then you're going to know how those guys fought. And you're going to capitalize on successes and learn from mistakes. You don't walk into the same fight and get cracked, right? But you walk in knowing how the guy fights. And then you might find out you don't even have to fight him because that guy is kicking himself in the butt. That's what history will do. So with that, we're going to get into uh, 125 years of America's occupation of Hawaii. So today's perception is we're the 50th state, right? 50th state. And now, well, that was formed in 1959. The predecessor to the 50th state is what is called the Territory of Hawaii, 1900. The predecessor of the territory was the Republic of Hawaii, 1894. And the predecessor of the Republic was a provisional government in 1893, January 17. That's the genealogy of the state. So what is the authority of the state of Hawaii? Well, right here, Public Law 86-3. It was an act to provide for the admission of the state of Hawaii into the Union. What is important to know is that this is an American law passed by the United States Congress. That's what, what you have to keep in mind, okay? Remember, these are football rules, and it's an important rule to know. This is what is called a municipal law. Municipal law, a domestic law of the United States. Now, the authority of the territory of Hawaii was April 30th, 1900, an act to provide a government for the territory of Hawaii. What's important is, it is a municipal law passed by the United States Congress. Keep that in mind now, it's a municipal law. Now, this law makes a direct link to the Republic of Hawaii. It says, section one, that the phrase, the laws of Hawaii, as used in this act, without qualifying words, shall mean the constitution and laws of the Republic of Hawaii. So right there is a direct link to the Republic. But the Republic of Hawaii was not created by the United States. It's not created by a municipal law. The authority of the Republic of Hawaii was July 3rd, 1894, in Hawaii. And the Republic of Hawaii was actually not a government. It was a U.S. insurgency, disguising itself to be a government. And the authority of the provisional government was January 17, 1893, proclamation. This provisional government was the insurgency installed by the U.S. Ambassador John Stevens with the protection of 160 U.S. Marines. So that is the authority of who these people are. You know, a lot of people, when, when they say genealogy, like when my tutu told me, you know my genealogy? Okay, when I found my genealogy, you see the names. What you gotta do is you gotta go and find out who these people are so it takes them off the page and brings life to who they are. So when I showed you 50th state, territory of Hawaii, Republic of Hawaii, and the provisional government, those are just names. What I'm showing here, I'm giving a body and a voice to those names and who they really were. 
Now, in 1993, the United States Congress passed a law called a joint resolution apologizing for the illegal overthrow and offered an apology to Native Hawaiians. Now, what's important about this joint resolution, it's a municipal law passed by Congress, Congress created. Now, in that joint resolution, it's riddled with misinformation, totally. It's like, if you know the game of football, and you know the game of baseball, this thing has football rules, baseball rules, badminton rules, golf rules, all in one document. It's confusion, right? But, whatever it is, it is still a what? A municipal law. A municipal law. So the 1993 Apology Resolution, the 1959 Statehood Act, and the 1900 Territorial Act are all municipal laws of the United States. So the next question would be, what is a municipal law? Right? So according to the dictionary, a municipal law is defined as pertaining solely to the citizens and inhabitants of a state or country, and is thus distinguished from international law. So municipal laws only apply within your territory, called domestic laws. International law is a law between nations. So the word inter means between. So laws between nations, those are treaties, those are custom. Right? Is the apology resolution in the state of international law? What is it? Municipal law. Okay, we're slowly getting into football because we're going to do an off-tackle run pretty soon. <laughs> Now, before United States municipal laws can be applied over Hawaii, there must be a treaty under international law that Hawaii became a part of the United States, right? It has to become a part of the United States in order for American laws to apply to Hawaii. Just as American laws cannot apply to Canada, and Canadian law cannot apply to America, well, the same would be for another country called the Hawaiian Kingdom, but if Hawaii became a part of the United States, then American municipal laws would definitely apply. Okay? So, what, what does international law say about how does one country become a part of another country? They actually have it, it's called session. And you may have heard that term being used in the previous presentation, session. C-E-S-S-I-O-N, right? Session. Okay. So, session, according to Professor Oppenheim, a leading expert in international law, Session of territory, state territory, national territory, is the transfer of sovereignty over state territory by the owner state to another state. And the only form in which a session can be affected is an agreement embodied in a treaty between the conveying and the receiving state. It's like a deed. Yeah? If you buy a piece of property, you have the person granting you the deed, and you have the person receiving the deed. One is called a grantor, the other is a grantee, and the deed is the evidence the title was transferred. Right? So here we have two sovereign entities, two governments representing these two sovereign entities. One will cede territory to another country voluntarily under international law. They will negotiate and an agreement will be made and the transaction completed. The second would be involuntary, happens during war. Jennifer made a point in international relations, there's a difference between what is called a state of peace and a state of war. Those are matters of international law. Okay? So in a state of peace, one country can cede its territory to another country, and during a state of war, a country can cede its territory to another country, which is involuntary, but that's what's going to end the war, and that's what is called a treaty of peace. So here's the United States of America. You got the East Coast over there. That was the former British colonies that became 13 independent states in a confederation in 1783. In 1789, these 13 independent states gave up their independence into the United States of America, called a federation, okay? The Union. How did America could get all those lands to the West and South? Treaties. Treaties of session. Anybody know the first treaty of session that took place between the United States and a foreign country? Give me an example. I was in The Hague. And uh, I made a, a statement about Napoleon in The Hague in the Netherlands. And the waiter corrected me. He said, Napoleon. 
then. <laughs> Napoleon. Next time you come to Hawaii, it's Kalako. <laughs> so that was the hint, Napoleon. Louisiana Purchase. 1803. Those territories before 1803 was covered by French municipal law. After 1803, American municipal law. Anybody know about area we call Florida today? Where did that come from? Spain, 1819. The treaty. Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, parts of Idaho. Used to be British, 1846. Alaska, way up there, 1867, from whom? Russia. And this area there that we now call California, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Mexico. <laughs> the Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo, 1848. Okay? That is how you acquire territory under international law. Right? And that's all legal. So what is the authority of annexation for Hawaii? How did Hawaii become a part of the United States? Well, July 7, 1898, Joint Resolution Number 55, joint, re joint Resolution to provide for annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States. Big problem. That's not a treaty. That's a municipal law. The United States passed a law purportedly annexing a foreign country. Can you do that? Nope. Well, actually you can, they did. But a municipal law has no effect beyond the borders of the United States. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's why uh, we weren't annexed. That's like somebody, that's why I remember when uh, Willie, Dr. Kauai, was asked by uh, that uh, far-right conservative says, oh, do you want to break away, do you want to secede from the United States? He says, no, before you can secede, you got to be a part of the United States. That's like saying, do you want to divorce from the United States? No, you got to be married first. <laughs> We're not married. There's no license. There's no agreement, right? So that's, so instead of saying, uh, we've been adopted, uh, we've been kidnapped. Or a treaty like was adopted. And you were taught, we're adopted. And we're led to believe that Uncle Sam was our uncle. Even though Uncle Sam doesn't look like my uncles. <laughs> we look like a tall holiday with a gold tee and a top hat. <laughs> joke, joke, joke. Because <laughs> a part of me comes from the United States. My great grandfather also came from Tennessee, Sparta, Tennessee. That's the Reeves Ohana. Right? So I'm also an American. My parentage from my from my mom's side. It's Keanu Reeves, the movie actor. That's all our Ohana. You know from Sparta, Tennessee. But again, that's a nationality question. That's not a question of country. We're talking country here, right? Make sense? Okay. So a joint resolution is not a treaty. That's important. It's not a treaty. It is a municipal law, which is limited to the United States of America. Now let's see what they were saying back then about what we are now just starting to realize. Well, in 1898, they were going to talk about this joint resolution. They're going to debate it in the House of Representatives, and then it moves to the Senate. Representative Thomas Ball from Texas, he says, the annexation of Hawaii by joint resolution is unconstitutional, unnecessary, and unwise. That territory could only be constitution acquired by a treaty. Look like he got it. <laughs> well, Senator Augustus Bacon from Georgia, he says, the annexation of foreign territory was necessarily and essentially the subject matter of a treaty, and it could not be accomplished legally and constitutionally by a statute or a joint resolution. So remember the state with that? That's a statute. Annexation, that's a joint resolution. Joint resolution is an agreement between the House and Senate. Okay? And then we also have Senator Allen from Nebraska. He says the Constitution and the statutes are territorial in their operation. That is, they can have no, they can have, they cannot have any binding force or operation beyond the territorial limits of the government in which they are promulgated. In other words, the Constitution and statutes cannot reach across the territorial boundaries of the United States into the territorial domain of another government and affect that government or persons or property therein. Wow, they are saying the same thing I just explained to you. 
See, this is called political science. This is uh, poli sci 130, Ancient to American Politics. This is how laws are made. It's not argue. It's not arguable. That's just the way it is. So, how did Hawaii become a part of the United States? That would be the follow-up question, right? If it, if not by a treaty and not by a joint resolution, then how? Well, keep in mind a visual here. The joint resolution passed by the U.S. Congress in Washington, D.C. You have borders. U.S. laws have no effect on the borders of the United States. So what does the U.S. Supreme Court say with regard to American law, which the U.S. congressmen were saying with regard to U.S. law? Well, in 19, 1824, in New Holland, a court case that was at the U.S. Supreme Court, they said the laws of no nation can justly extend beyond its own territory. They can have no force to control the sovereignty of any other nation. Then in 1936, they reiterated that in another Supreme Court case. Neither the Constitution, they were referring to the federal Constitution, nor the laws, congressional laws, passed in pursuance of it have any force in foreign territory. Okay, so right there. That means Hawaii wasn't annexed. Does that make sense now? It's not trying to find how it got annexed. It wasn't annexed because the joint resolution cannot annex a foreign country. It's a municipal law. So how are you supposed to be looking at these issues then? Are we supposed to continue to look through the American law as the lens to understand? No, let's take another look at the U.S. Supreme Court. It says, and operations of the nation, the United States, in such territory, which is in foreign territory, must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law. This is what is called football rules. Baseball rules, U.S. constitutional law. Wrong game. We're playing football. Once you start to get that right theor theoretical framework in mind, everything starts to make sense. Otherwise, everything just seems like gobbledygook, right? And everybody's getting angry, right? There's a Olelo Noel that refers to the Kahoe fight, the water court. It's actually a Hawaiian proverb. The water gourd represents the person, and water in the gourd represents knowledge. The gourd with a little bit of water makes the most noise when you shake it. You guys got that one? So you get a lot of swishing. Uncle, auntie, get more water. Fulfill the gourd. Yeah. So that is a sign from a mo'olelo of the past that speaks to how important it is to be aware because that is what calms the fears. So when you hear swishing, you say, brother, we get more water, right? And that's what we're doing at the University of Hawaii. We tap into the, the well. Hope, choke water. <laughs> choke. You know, in the beginning though, we was all dehydrated up because we never drink water for 125 years up. Choke thirsty, but you know, you kind of drink water quickly the first time, right? You can spit them back out because it's all dried out. You always got to start off with, get the water, wet the lid, <laughs> begin to get hydrated, right? What you heard from us at the university, well, we chug in water, you know? But for somebody to chug what we chug, people spit it out because they can't take it, right? It goes against everything they believe. That's why it's a process. It's a process. So remember, crawl, walk, run. Don't run when you just was born. <laughs> crawl. Actually, don't even crawl yet. Just try to get your legs up, you know, when your whole pool's on the ground. And gradually flip over. You know, it's a process. So I'm not here to try to get everybody to be on the same page. But I do want you folks to get those points that are important. Municipal law. International law. Session. Make sense? So far, you guys got those up. Okay, because those are fundamental for this, for this game of football, right? Okay, so we need to know what is international law. That's what we need to know. And here is something that puzzled somebody in 1988, 90 years after 1898 so-called annexation. The Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. stumbled over this information. And they tried to drink the water and they spit it out, right? Because it went against everything they thought. 
The Department of Justice was looking into how does the United States as a country extend its territorial seas. There are two types of territories under international law that are recognized. You got territory, which is land, and that's where the municipal laws apply, right? But you also have what is called the territorial sea, and that's a three mile limit that the municipal law also applies over. And did you know where they got the three mile limit from in 1817, 16, what, 1700s? It was as far as a cannon can fire. Yeah, three mile distance. So if you're running from the authorities and you're on a ship and you're a pirate and you get hit with cannon fire and you sink, you are in the territorial sea of that country. Once you go past the three mile limit and that cannon fire is hitting right in front of you, guess what? You're in international waters. That's where the territorial sea came from. Well, the Law of the Sea Convention was a treaty that was passed in the 1980s at the United Nations, but the United States did not ratify or sign that treaty. That treaty extended the territorial sea from three miles to an additional nine miles, so a 12 mile limit. See, no longer was it a three mile limit because of cannon fire. What they had to take into consideration was a Tomahawk missile <laughs> going past the three miles. Joke. <laughs> but I'm just saying, weaponry, increase the distance. But the United States didn't sign it, so it wasn't executed under the law by signing and ratifying the treaty. So the Department of um, Justice was asked by the U.S. State Department, could you provide an opinion on how the United States can extend the territorial seas on its own under international law? So they concluded that the president is the only entity that can extend the territorial sea by proclamation because the president is the sole representative of the United States in international affairs. He doesn't need to make an agreement with another country. He can make an extension as long as the 12 additional nine miles does not fall in the territory of another country. So like the west coast, the east coast, maybe the southern coast might be a little different because you're dealing with Cuba and the Caribbeans, but I know the west coast has no problem. So. As they looked into the president's authority, they looked into whether or not Congress could do it. And they stumbled over the joint resolution of annexation of Hawaii. This is in 1988 in Washington, D.C. So in their legal opinion, they said that despite the constitutional objections, they were noting the objections made by Congress, congressional uh, members. Despite the objections, Congress approved the joint resolution and President McKinley signed the measure in 1898. Nevertheless, whether this action demonstrates the constitutional power of Congress to acquire territory is certainly questionable. And that's when we're going, hmm. We're going to move from quickly the OMG to the WTF. It is therefore unclear which constitutional power Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii by a joint resolution. That's when they started scratching their heads. Now they must be thinking U.S. military bases, 118 of them over here. Oh, oh, people in the world think this is the 50th state. Oh, it's almost like they just covered the line. And they don't know what to do about it. What I find ironic is just five years later, in 1993, the apology resolution pops up, which was also another joint resolution. Now that, ap that apology resolution made and framed this idea of Hawaii's overthrow as if it was a native issue. Yeah, they made it real native. That they only apologized to the native Hawaiians. As Willie explained, you had Hawaiians that weren't native. Alan, he was black, but he was Hawaiian. That's what the real issue is. But they made it look like it was a racial issue. They started putting the term self-determination in the apology resolution when self-determination wouldn't apply if the Hawaiian kingdom is already a country. Self-determination only applies if you want to be a country. That's called decolonization. And inherent sovereignty that they have there in the law, inherent sovereignty is from federal Indian law. That, that applies to recognized federal tribes. State sovereignty is international law, not inherent sovereignty. That's an American-created uh, term in federal Indian law. So, I just find it interesting that five years after this, it's like they threw the red herring over there. Look! Okay, so for Hawaiians that don't, don't know what the red herring is, they say, uh, Chora Akule over there, 
and don't look over here. <laughs> and everybody went chasing no coolie. <laughs> now here's something interesting. How are they going to hide this illegality when the U.S. Supreme Court said American laws have no effect on the borders of the United States? How are they going to hide the fact that the Congress congressional delegates knew that American laws and the joint resolution has no effect? Well, we're going to get a hint. Hiding the illegality as a political question. In 1900, during the debate of the Organic Act, Senator Allen made a statement and said, the joint resolution of annexation is void, null and void, because it has no authority. The response given by this guy, Je uh, Senator Spooner from Wisconsin, he's a constitutional lawyer too, now, so he knows something. He says the Hawaiian Islands were annexed to the United States by a joint resolution passed by Congress. I reassert that that was a political question and it will never be reviewed by the Supreme Court or any other judicial tribunal. What does he mean by that? A lot of times it will go over people's head. Yeah, no, but, but how, what does that mean though? How can the Supreme Court not do that if it's a legal issue? Somebody can file a complaint. Right? and say, hey, I'm in Hawaii, I'm always not part of the United States, I'm going to contest IRS taxation, right? Because that's an American municipal law. But why is he saying it'll never be reviewed? Well, the political question is a doctrine. And it's a doctrine or an understood practice in America in the 19th century that went up until 1962. Okay? It was a practice. So basically, the political question doctrine forced American courts to accept the factual determinations of the executive or legislative branches on a particular subject even if their determinations were unconstitutional. So the political question is whether or not the legislature made a factual determination. And the factual determination goes back to what he says. The Hawaiian Islands were annexed to the United States by a joint resolution passed by Congress. In other words, what he's saying is because Congress did it, you don't question it. And that's the doctrine. And that's how it was locked under lock and key called the political question doctrine. Okay. So no matter how illegal it was, Congress did it. Move on. And that's the guy Spooner, Senator Spooner. Okay. So this is malicious intent to know they're going to conceal the illegal occupation of Hawaii by hiding it under the political question doctrine. Because the U.S. Supreme Court and all courts will never address this issue. And now you can understand Prince Kuhiro, who's up in Washington and up there trying to figure this thing out. To him, it's locked in and it's called survival. Now he's got to play the game called the Hawaiian Homes Act. Now he's got to play the game of playing in the system. But playing the system doesn't mean you are promoting the system. What was happening back then with this idea of a political question doctrine, Principal Hill, what is he gonna do? He's gotta do something, right? But this, this gives you some context, why things were done the way they were done back then. So what is the legal status of the Hawaiian Kingdom? Obviously it's not part of the United States and whether or not the political question doctrine hides it, all they're hiding is the illegality. They're not hiding the occupation. The occupation is 2,400 miles off the west coast of the United States. It's not in Washington, D.C. It's not in their courts. It's the illegality that is in their courts that are being protected, but not the factual situation of Hawaii being occupied. Well, it says in the 19th century, the Permanent Court of Arbitration and its arbitration award said in the 19th century, the Hawaiian Kingdom existed as an independent state recognized as such by the United States, Great Britain, and various other states. Now, people today use the word independent wrong. Wrong. Independent, which precedes a state, is very specific. It has meaning, right? Because not all states are independent. The state of New York is not independent. The state of California is not independent. But the state of Israel is independent. The state of Belgium is independent. The state of France is independent but the state of Massachusetts is not. The term independence, by definition, is a political term. 
it means that only your laws exist over your territory to the exclusion of other laws of other countries over their territories. So Canada is an independent state. The United States of America is an independent state. Mexico is an independent state. And only Mexican law, American law, and Canadian law apply over their territories through what kind of law? Municipal laws. Exactly. So independence is tied to municipal laws. Right? For them to say that the Hawaiian Kingdom existed as an independent state, that meant that every foreigner or alien that came to Hawaii understood that they were subject to Hawaiian Kingdom law in Hawaiian territory under Hawaiian municipal law. Just as a Hawaiian subject traveling to California in 1880 is subject to American law, because America is independent. They cannot claim protection from Hawaiian law. And Americans in Hawaii cannot claim protection from American law because they're independent. But when you have a duality of laws in one and the same territory, that's what would render that territory or that state not independent. So the state of New York, there are more than New York law that applies to New York territory, right? What kind of law? Federal law, which is municipal law, right? So in New York, you actually have a duality of laws. Federal law, New York law. And the laws made by the feds they're not in New York, they're in Washington, D.C. making those laws. But did you know that New York used to be independent? You guys know that? For six years. 1783, the revolution ended, right? King George III signed the Treaty of Peace, recognizing the 13 former colonies as 13 independent states. And they're in what is called a confederation. A confederation is not a federation, a confederation is a union of independent states, like the European Union is a confederation. You can still be an independent state and be in the union, right? But once you give up your independence, which was in 1789, they created what is called the Federation. Now the independence is in the United States of America. All these 13 former colonies, which became independent states, gave up their independence to the national government. Make sense? Now during the Civil War, the South were trying to reclaim the Confederacy, meaning they were still independent, but in a loose union called the Confederacy. So now you can understand why they were called Confederate soldiers. And the ones who they were fighting were Federalist soldiers. So, a little terminology here. You guys okay? Yeah. You know what, so I, I, was, I was sharing with uh, my wife's family, Primo and them, I said, Brown, sometimes when you have talking about Hawaiian history, it looks like a sovereignty movement, they're really sharing their manao. I said, I was sitting over there, I'm watching, it looked like everybody was in class. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> it's really, it's a matter of education. And you know what? I'm just continuing that aspect here and bringing up to date. <laughs> so, in 1893, did you know that there were only 44 independent states? Only 44. Hawaii was one of them. The others were part of empires, the British Empire, the French Empire, colonial territories. In 1945, when the United Nations was formed, there were only 46. But today, there's 197, 193 of them are members of the UN. But the UN began with only 46 members. How did these other countries become a part of the UN? Remember that term, self-determination? Colonial territories decided for themselves to become an independent state. And then they joined the United Nations, such as India, Pakistan, uh, Algeria. Okay? These were all former European territories and colonies. So when you can see that they started to use self-determination in the Apology Resolution, make it apply to Hawaii, that is completely off base if the Hawaiian Kingdom was an independent state already. You don't exercise self-determination twice. You exercise it when you achieve independence. Right? Hawaii had that in 1843. That's what we're celebrating, La Kuokoa, Independence Day. So does everybody understand what independence is? So we're not seeking independence. This is not a movement toward independence. This is not a sovereignty movement, an independence movement. This is a reality check. We're independent already, and we're occupied. Because when you're occupied, that independence mandates the United States as an occupier to administer the laws of the occupied state, which are Hawaiian municipal laws, not American municipal laws. And I'll kind of show that as we go through this. Yes. So, state of peace and a state of war. 
Somebody says war, no. I don't see anybody killing each other. Actually, you can be in a state of war without shooting each other. During World War II, Luxembourg was invaded by Germany. Luxembourg didn't resist. There was still a state of war. And Germany, just like America did in 1898, passed the law saying, we now got Luxembourg, we just annexed you. They didn't annex them. There's no treaty. And then, 1945, guess what? Nazis are being prosecuted for war crimes, for violations in Luxembourg and other occupied territories. So, very similar history, but you don't have to be shooting each other to be in a state of war. But what you have to have in order to initiate a state of war is an act of hostility, hostility, excuse me, hostility, like an invasion, right? Or a, a, a shootout, something hostile from a foreign country. So Christopher Greenwood, former judge of the International Court of Justice says, traditional international law is based on a rigid distinction between a state of peace and a state of war. Countries were either in a state of peace or in a state of war, there was no middle stage, right? So it's like being Hapai. You eat a Hapai or you're not Hapai, right? You're not a uh, Hapai? So those who, for those who don't know what Hapai means, it's about being pregnant. <laughs> That's why for being pregnant, am I? Go check. <laughs> Chances are you might be. But there's no middle ground, right? Now, what changes the situation from not being Hapai to being Hapai? There was some event that happened, right? <laughs> some event that happened. The same thing would apply to a state of war. That event has to be an act of hostility. That's what triggers it. This act of hostility is also known as an act of war. That is an international term that tells you there was an act of hostility. Now, these two state of affairs are also reflected in Oppenheim, he's a leading expert in international law recognized throughout the world. <coughs> Volume 1, Peace. Volume 2, War and Neutrality. So the Hawaiian Kingdom was also a neutral state. It was recognized as a neutral state in several treaties, one of which was the Spanish Treaty with the Hawaiian Kingdom. The only time neutrality comes in is during war. Neutrality does not come in during peace. And what neutrality does, it protects your country from an invasion by other countries who are at war. Back in 1893, there were only four countries that were recognized as neutral countries. Hawaiian Kingdom, Luxembourg, Belgium, Switzerland. When NATO took place, well, sorry, yeah, when NATO took place, Luxembourg and Belgium gave up their neutrality. They became a member. The only neutral country by treaty, Switzerland today, and the Hawaiian Kingdom. So even if war broke out between the Spanish and the Americans in the Pacific, Hawaii could not be touched. We were like Switzerland in the middle of the Pacific. But if you disguise the history and you get people to believe something that's not true, anything's possible. Once you get back to what's true, you're going, no, you weren't supposed to do that. Now there's consequences. So let's get into what actually happened. Let's not try to interpret what happened. President Cleveland said what happened. Now it's important in, it, in U.S. constitutional law, the President of the United States is the person or office that represents the United States of America, not the Congress, not the courts. So when the United States President speaks, you got to be careful what he says, because he will trigger certain things. I'm sure you can understand now why everybody in Washington is quite concerned about Donald Trump, because he just says whatever's on his head. In his head. Or should I say on his head? Listen, I don't think it's in his head. <laughs> he just says some crazy stuff. But what he says will have a consequence under international law. That's how it works, right? Well, here's President Cleveland, much more grounded in knowledge and understanding of what the president is, he actually initiated an investigation of what took place here starting on January 16, 1893 with an invasion of the U.S. Marines. Queen Lili Okalani actually yielded her authority to the U.S. president to investigate, called upon him to investigate what happened. President Cleveland took that up on March 9, 1893, two months after the takeover. He sent over to Hawaii James Blunt. James Blunt, special commissioner, his job was a fact finder. Start gathering information, taking depositions, 
sending all that information to Washington, D.C., Secretary of State Walter Gresham. He's going to be gathering this information. Now, Secretary of State Walter Gresham was a judge in New York before he became Secretary of State, so he has that legal mind. He gathered the information when the investigation was complete, and he notified the president on October 18, 1893, we're in a wrong. The Hawaiian Kingdom yielded its authority on a threat of war. He's using war, the terms, right? Then President Cleveland, uh, in, on December 18, 1893, gives a message to Congress. Now, when he gives a message to Congress, the other ambassadors of the world are also listening, right? Because what he says will speak to how it impl uh, implicates them as well. So he begins with, on the 16th day of January, 1893, between 4 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, a detachment of Marines from the United States steamer Boston with two pieces of artillery landed at Honolulu. The men, upwards of 160 in all, were supplied with double cartridge belts filled with ammunition and with haversacks and canteens and were accompanied by a hospital corps with stretchers and medical supplies. What do you folks think they landed for? Marshmallows at Kapiolani Park, roasting. Make one day. Learn the hospitality of the local culture. <laughs> well, it's not what we think. The key is what does President Cleveland think. So he states, this military demonstration upon the soil of Honolulu was of itself an act of war. He just acknowledged that January 16th triggered state of war. That's what he did. Then he recites the Queen's surrender, conditional surrender. Lili Kalani on January 17, 1893 stated, I, Lili Kalani, by the grace of God and under the constitution of the Hawaiian Kingdom, Queen, do hereby solemnly protest against any and all acts done against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian Kingdom by certain persons claiming to have established a provisional or temporary government of and for this kingdom. That I yield to the superior force of the United States, whose minister plenipotentiary, another word for ambassador, His Excellency John Stevens has caused United States troops to be landed at Honolulu and declared that he would support the provisional government. Now to avoid any collision of armed force and perhaps the loss of life, I do this under protest and impelled by said force, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States shall upon the facts being presented to it, undo the action of its representatives and reinstate me in the authority of which I claim as the Constitutional Sovereign of the Hawaiian Islands. Pretty clear cut. President Cleveland acknowledged it, and that's why he sent James Blount to Hawaii. In Hawaii's history books, it's known as the Blount Reports. You see that in Hawaii history books. But they all got it wrong. Everybody focuses on the Blount Reports and not what Cleveland said. Cleveland said from the Blount Reports. Blount was just gathering the facts. He was not making determinations. Nor did a... Uh, uh, Secretary of State Walter Gresham, he brought, he came to some conclusions, but it wasn't binding until the president does it, right? And December 18, it's binding. Then President Cleveland continues to state, this wrongful recognition by our minister or ambassador placed the government of the queen in a position of most perilous perplexity. On the one hand, she had the possession of the palace, of the barracks, and of the police station and had at her command at least 500 fully armed men and several pieces of artillery. Now just this talk, do you think they're talking like they're in peacetime? Even the president is acknowledging the queen as artillery. They got fully armed men, right? You're talking war. That's what we're talking about. Indeed, Cleveland says, the whole military force of her kingdom was on her side and at her disposal. In this state of things, if the Queen could have dealt with the insurgents alone, her course would have been plain and the result unmistakable. Okay. Keyword, insurgents. The provisional government is not a government. President Cleveland said they're insurgents. Right? That is the source of the genealogy of the state of Hawaii. Insurgency. Insurgents are criminals. Insurgency Commit the crime of high treason. If you are convicted, you get punishment, punished by death, and all your property is confiscated. It's a high crime, right? But I just want to make sure, insurgents, so let's stop calling these people in 1893 businessmen who overthrew the Hawaiian kingdom. Not even say government. And yet it wasn't even the government, it was the Marines that did it. What these guys did was stand there and say, you got them? Yeah, you got them, okay, good. 
to me, these guys are cowards. At least when I was in the Army, you know, I would have more respect for these guys, Sanford Gold and them, if they picked up the weapon and really acted like a real insurgency and believed in what you were believing in, and then you shot dead. Then I say that was an insurgent. Imagine what's going on in the minds of Queen Lili, Okala, and all the Hawaiian subjects who are police officers. They're looking at these guys and go, wow, these guys are being protected by those Marines. See, that's what made it an international problem. And I'm so thankful that we had a woman in charge in 1893. Oh, we light them up. Exactly. What did they just say? Hey, what's up? We light them up? Okay. That's what I say. And, and I make this joke. I say, yeah, you're one guy over there. King Kiola Nui. And he was like, bro, take them on. There's only 160 of them. I'm not realizing they get millions coming from America. But. I like to crack this joke though, because it's good, because I would say the same thing. See, men would be Tantaran, yeah? Tantaran. You guys know what Tantaran comes from, huh? Yeah, because I kind of started explaining that a few years back. Tantaran is not Dylan Wan. <laughs> Blood me. Tantaran is a slang for Superman. Tantaran. So when brother is, you say, brother, I'm going to play Tantaran. I don't know, play Superman. I'm glad I wasn't there because I would be like, da da da. <laughs> <laughs> I was a patriot. No, no. No. But for the queen and what she was doing, she was looking out for the country. She knew she could have taken them. And you know what was awesome about President Cleveland? He acknowledged that. He said she could have taken out easily the 160 Marines. That's heavy. That's a sign of respect that Hawaii had the capacity of protecting itself even from an invasion of U.S. Marines. Because Marshal Charles Wilson, the head of the law enforcement, did you know also that guy was not Kanaka? Uh, he was actually Ta'ata. Ta'ata Maori. Charles Wilson was half Tahitian, half Hawaiian. But he was Hawaiian. Point subject. He was ready to go. He, he told the queen, I'm going through these Marines. I'm going to go and all, all this police force was ready. The queen had to say, stand down. Don't play Tantaran. <laughs> and she was right. Because you know what? If we engage and we lost, guess what happens? We get a treaty of peace that transfers all of Hawaii to the United States. That's what happened to Mexico with all California properties. Yeah, actually, America started the war, and they hit, and then they lost. Right? So, I'm glad we had a Wahimi in charge. Yeah, so I just have to make that point. Because yeah. the queen, unbelievable, unbelievable. Her mindset, and she was still able to be focused. Amazing, yeah, truly amazing. Then President Cleveland concluded, uh, Further states, but the United States has had allied, her, had, had allied itself with her enemies and had recognized them as the true government of Hawaii and had put her and her adherents in the position of opposition against lawful authority. So the Queens, she wanted to know, did the United States recognize these guys? Because these are insurgents. And the US ambassador said, yep, we did. See, now that puts it in a different position for the Queen. Now she's dealing with the United States of America, not with a bunch of insurgents. And she's got to be careful. She knew, as Cleveland said, that she could not withstand the power of the United States, but she believed that she might safely trust to its justice. President Cleveland's uh, message also states that the government of the Queen was undisputed and was both the de facto, in fact, and the de jure lawful government. And when he referred to the provisional government, the insurgents, he said, when our ambassador recognized the provisional government, the only basis upon which it rested was they said it exists. It was neither government de facto nor de jure. He continued to say it was self-declared. So that means it's still an insurgency. So Sanford Doe is an insurgent. He's not the president of the provisional government. Yeah, so don't give him that much dignity. He's an insurgent. Not his family. Him. Like my father commits a crime? Him. Not my fault. Hold my father accountable. But you know what? Sanford Doe was a criminal. Samuel Dane is a criminal. But yet, they managed to portray themselves in Hawaii as the pillars of society. You get schools named after these people, right? So you just kind of see where this is coming from, you know? For a lot of people that live in Hawaii, like, I remember that name. Really? I didn't know that. 
That's what these guys were. Then President Cleveland concludes, by an act of war with the participation of a diplomatic representative of the United States and without authority of Congress, the government of a feeble, feeble is not derogatory, feeble means a weak, small nation. Because Hawaii was a small nation, right? Feeble but friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. These admitted acts of war, January 16th and January 17th, acknowledges Hawaii's been a state of war. And international law, is supposed to explain now what happens, not American law, right? Not American municipal law. So to transform, to transform the state of war to a state of peace, there needs to be a treaty of peace. Let me give you an example. Four, there are four stages in international relations with regard to war. And I'll use Japan and the United States as an example. December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the military here in Hawaii. President uh, uh, Roosevelt said that that was an uh, act of war. Right? So December 7th was the state of war, treaty. Now some people say, oh, Congress got to declare war, joint resolution. No. There was actually a court case. Captain Banyan. Captain Banyan was a naval officer who was killed in the attack in Pearl Harbor. He had a life insurance policy with New York Life Insurance. In that policy, there was an exclusion. It did not cover death during a war. The family was saying he wasn't killed during war, he was killed when declaration of war was made on December 8th, not December 7th. Went to the federal court, he said no. He died December 7th, after war is a fact. Declaration of war is a formality. And that case was called New York Life Insurance versus Banyan. So that gives you an idea when the state of war begins. Make sense? Because it's a fact when the act of hostility takes place. Not when somebody says, oh yeah, by the way, that was an act of hostility. No, but now it starts. No, it starts when the act of war started. Act of hostility. So, once the state of war began between the United States and uh, Japan, then there was fighting, and it lasted for four years until 1945, September, right? A treaty of surrender, right? You guys heard about the treaty of surrender, 1945, the USS Missouri, it's in Pearl Harbor now, it was in Japan. They signed the documents, General MacArthur was there. Okay, that didn't terminate the state of war. It was still in a state of war. That initiated America's occupation of Japan from 1945 to 1952. General MacArthur was the military governor of the military government that was administering Japanese municipal laws, not American laws. Then a treaty of peace was signed and ratified signed in San Francisco, ratified 1952. 1952 was when the occupation end, ended and a state of peace was restored with Japan between the United States of America and Japan. So America and Japan was in a state of war from 1941 to 1952, 11 years. It didn't stop in 1945. No, no, it, it, it's, it's not, remember I said the, the, the state of war was not against Hawaii. Japan, who did Japan attack here in Hawaii? American. American military. So that act of hostility from Japanese military to American military is an act of war between two sovereign states, even in territory they're occupied. Exactly. See, that's why you're not supposed to be occupying a neutral territory, because otherwise you bring that country into harm's way. Yeah, there's actually a provision, Article 1 of the Hague Convention Number 5. Neutral, uh, neutral states. The territory of a neutral state is inviolable. Which means you cannot place military installations in the territory of a neutral state, or you bring that neutral state into harm's way. Yeah, so that's what happened in 1941. The Hawaiian Kingdom as a neutral state and occupied got invaded with an attack of Japan on American military. Now, a lot of people don't know, people died who weren't military. Anti-aircraft weapons are rounds going in the air. Boom, 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 boom. What goes up? Gotta come down. Civilians were getting killed in Kamuki, uh, Pro, Pro City, all outside of the, the base. That was the reality. And that is a war crime. No, and that's what gets into protected persons and all that stuff. Remember, this is football rules now. It's a rough game, right? So, one thing that we have to understand is what was overthrown illegally per the President of the United States. 
in international relations and international law, you distinguish between what is called the state or the country and its government. Because the government exercises the sovereignty of a state. The government is not sovereign. That's why states are sovereign. They're called independent and sovereign states, which is authority. Okay, they're independence. But that authority is exercised by a government. Now, whether that government is constitutional, autocratic, aristocratic, chaotic, whatever the, it is, it is not the state. Right? So what was overthrown in 1893 was not the state, it was its government. So Hawaii state sovereignty was exercised by a Hawaiian kingdom government, which you folks heard. That government was acknowledged to have been illegally overthrown by the United States president. That does not mean the country was overthrown. So the issue now after 1893 is not whether or not the Hawaiian kingdom government exists, it's whether or not the Hawaiian kingdom exists as a state. And that term state is important. Just like municipal law, just like independence, state, right? Independent state. state. Okay. So that independence is what is called municipal law, right? That's what is applied over the territory of that state. Article 43 of the Hague Convention of 1907. Now let me begin, start off first with the 1907 Hague Convention. The 1907 Hague Convention regulates the laws of war on land. Prior to that, it was called the 1899 Hague Convention. Prior to that, which is called 1893, when everything happened, it was called International Humanitarian Law, called Customary Law which was fully acknowledged internationally. So among the 44 countries that existed in 1893, they all knew what the law of occupation was. What the 1899 Hague Convention and the 1907 Hague Convention did was merely codify existing international law. It did not create a new law. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's important to know because I've heard some people, hey, it doesn't apply because look at the dates. Well, that means that person they didn't really understand what international law is, and that's what we do at the university. If they were to take my class, they would know that the law of occupation that comes out under Article 43 was actually in existence, actually during the Mexican-American War. The United States actually recognized it. And the United States actually codified laws of war in what is called the Libra Code of 1863, which became the foundation for the formation of the Hay Convention. Make sense? No? So as long as you know that it's, it's recognized international law. So Article 43 of the 1907 Hague Convention, this renowned jurist says, Article 43, which is to administer the laws of the occupied state. Article 43 does not confer on the occupying power any sovereignty over the occupied territory. The occupant may therefore not extend its own legislation over the occupied territory, nor act as a sovereign legislator. Isn't that exactly what the United States did? But that's also what Germany did. And that's what Iraq did when they invaded Kuwait and imposed Iraqi law in 1990. So countries do it, but it's still illegal. And then it's accountability is going to come after the hostilities anyway. Then he goes on to say, the expression laws enforced in the country in Article 43 refers not only to laws in the strict sense of the word, but also to the Constitution, decrees, ordinances, court precedents, as well as administrative regulations and executive orders. It's the entire independence of a country. Okay? So for the Hawaiian Kingdom, gathering rights, uh, history rights, um, uh, sole proprietorship rights, corporate rights. Well, we had corporations back in the Kingdom. We even had banks in the Kingdom. Uh, very progressive, the Hawaiian Kingdom. I mean, it was one of the 44 independent states. When foreigners come to Hawaii, they went, wow, this is a good place to live. Guess what? They apply for naturalization. It's pretty heavy for an American to give up their American citizenship and become a Hawaiian subject. And that's a testament as to what the system was. Act, absolutely. You're not going to go from this to something that I hope is going to work. You want to make sure this is good. So that's a testament as to what the Hawaiian kingdom was. Right? Now what happened in 1893 was just a change in the, with the pilot of a plane. So let's, I'm going to use this metaphor, Hawaiian Airlines, okay? So Hawaiian Airlines was flying high in the sky, the sovereign sky, with other sovereign airlines called American Airlines, British Airways, <laughs> France, right? Hawaii was 
Hawaiian Airlines. And we had a different type of plane than the United States. The American Airlines has a Boeing. We have an Airbus. So it looks different, right? But still flying high. And the pilot is Queen Lady Kukulani and her cabinet. In 1893, the only change that came was the Queen and her cabinet. Replaced by these insurgents with U.S. Marines protecting them. So nobody can go into the pilot seat because remember, Marshall Wilson wants to go in. And then after a while, they release sleeping gas into the cabin. Making everybody believe they're American. Then they paint Hawaiian Airlines right away to move, put American Airlines across. But everybody looked at them. This, this one airline going, something's wrong with this one. You know, when people come to Hawaii, uh, Hawaii just has this feeling like there's something different. Yeah, it's an Airbus. It's not a Boeing. Two different planes. The same color. Same music, right? Well, after a while, uh, the, 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 the sleeping gas wore off. Everybody's now slowly waking up to this reality and everybody's getting scared. But now everybody's focusing on the pilot, who's driving the plane, who's flying the plane. Because what we don't want is this plane to do a nosedive, politically, economically, for the problems of 1893 and the culprits back then. All of a sudden, we're left holding the bag. We need to figure out how to fix this problem. And that's what we're doing at the university, because there's a way to fix the problem. So to kind of explain this, change in, 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 in name and, and, and color. Hawaiian Kingdom, governmental structure, legislative, executive, judicial branches. Remember in the Kingdom, uh, all the, all, most of the high rate schools of Hawaii, actually from the Kingdom era, St. Louis, 1846. St. Louis was called St. Louis College. Iolani, 1870s. Uh, St. Andrew's Priory, 1870s. Punahou, 1830s. Uh, Midpac, actually that's Hawaii Seminary. Uh, Kamehameha is actually a young one, 1887, right? <laughs> all the public schools, actually from the Kingdom of Rome. Yeah. Uh, all the gubernatorial districts that, you, that we take for granted here, is from the Kingdom of Rome. All the circuit courts, Kingdom of Rome. Everything is from the Kingdom of Rome. The only thing they changed was the pilot. And really sleeping guys. And then everybody thinks that this system here was American created, but in fact it wasn't. It was just hijacked. Because how do you overthrow an entire government? No, you just change the head called a regime change. And then you protect them. But then how do you brainwash people? We're gonna get there. So all that changed, this infrastructure here was named. Structure stayed the same. From the Hawaiian Kingdom government and a monarch, being the chief executive, changed from the provisional government to a president, which changed the republic to a president, changed to a territory, to a governor, to the state of Hawaii to a governor. That infrastructure is the Hawaiian Kingdom. So we're not here to try to create another airplane. Uh, we just realized the best place to hide something is right in front of you. No way. Wow. The Sheriff's Department from the Kingdom of Maryland. All the teachers, everybody's from the Kingdom of Maryland. The Fire Department from the Kingdom of Maryland. Wow. Kind of changes your outlook here. It's like this, this is called a resource management now. <laughs> which begins with what is called crisis management. <laughs> well, remember I told you about the violations of during war, during World War II, the Germans. This is the indictment at the Nuremberg trials. And there are certain counts of the indictments. One particular count was Germanization, war crimes. Okay. When I show this, it looks eerily similar to what the United States did to Hawaii from 1893 to the mid-20th century. See, now we don't know because we're a part of the game. We were led to believe we're in it. But back then, my great-grandparents knew who the American was and who the Hawaiian was. And that wasn't a racial thing. That was a nationality. So this is an indictment against Hermann Gary, Rudolf Hess. These are Nazis. Country war crimes, Germanization of occupied territory. In certain occupied territories, purportedly annexed, like Luxembourg, to Germany, the defendants, the Nazis, not Germans, the Nazis, methodically and pursuant to plan, endeavored to assimilate those territories politically, culturally, socially, and economically into the German Reich. The defendants endeavored to obliterate the former national character of these territories. What they did was they took over the public the school system, they began to train, uh, teach the children how to be German. 
that you actually did. It's called Germanization. But they only had four years to do that. For Hawaii, it's going on 125 years right now. This plan included economic domination, physical conquest, installation of a puppet government, purported de jure or lawful annexation, and enforced conscription or drafting into the German armed forces. This was carried out in most of the occupied countries, including Norway, France, Luxembourg, the Soviet Union, Denmark, Belgium, and Holland. And that's pretty much what happened here. Conscription, it's called drafting. World War I, this was happening. Hawaiians now are fighting in Europe for America. Not that they joined the military, they were drafted. World War II, drafted. Korea, drafted. Vietnam, drafted. Me, I wasn't drafted, I joined, because I thought I was in the right army. But it's not, nothing wrong with it, at least I was in the wrong army. Yeah, I was still sleepy. Yeah, <laughs> I was still sleepy. Damn good training, though. <laughs> nothing wrong with being in the army, I just I was a mercenary. Right? So that's the way I look at it. So it's not against the United States Army, I'll do it, because it's a damn good system. But I was in the wrong system. But then I started to think about my uncles who were drafted in Vietnam. What about my uncle's friends who never came home, who died? Ooh, see, now this thing is getting serious. That was my paradigm shift. That's when I started, that's when I went down the rabbit hole. Alice in Wonderland. All of a sudden, a teapot is talking to me. A king of ace, king of hearts is talking to me. Oh! Then I came out of the rabbit hole. Now I'm taking you guys out of the rabbit hole. <laughs> so where these guys failed in four years, the United States administration during McKinley and a few of them after would have what we have today, 125 years. Something happened. What we call, what they call Germanization then, would be called Americanization here. So, on uh, January 17th, the Hawaiian Kingdom came under belligerent occupation. That was when the government was taken and the Queen yielded her authority. The law of occupation mandates the occupying state, the United States, to administer the laws of the occupied state, the Hawaiian Kingdom. According to Judge Crawford of the International Court of Justice, belligerent occupation, January 17, 1893, does not affect the continuity of the state even when there exists no government claiming to represent the occupied state. So the focus after the overthrow is not trying to get a government, but rather understanding about the Hawaiian state. And what is the Hawaiian state within the realm of international relations? How does that fit, right? Because you don't get a government together during occupation. It is the occupier is supposed to be administering the laws of the occupied state, not those that are occupied, okay? And that's Article 43. So how is it that we today don't know this information? I remember I told you about that 125 years. It's a lot of years. Well, this guy Samuel Damon, he's an insurgent. He's also a businessman with Charles Reed Bishop. Bishop and Company, which came to be known as First Hawaiian Bank. So Samuel Damon was an insurgent and part of the Republic of Hawaii. He was a so-called vice president of the provisional government. Yeah. He said, if we're ever to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is to obliterate the past. Obliterate the past. It's called denationalization. Now that's an opinion. You need him to carry it out. See, you need a policy. Right there is just an arrogant statement. Can he carry that out? Anybody know who Samuel Damon is and what he served in 1895? Not just as an insurgent, but what else did he do? I mean, well, he was a businessman. Trustee of Kamehameha Schools. All the trustees were insurgents. William O. Smith was a so-called attorney general of the, of, the of the provisional government. He's an insurgent. No. Um, anybody here from Kamehameha? Kamehameha schools because one of the buildings where the principal is in is called Smith Hall. Smith Hall is named after William O. Smith, the insurgent. And William O. Smith used to refer to Queen Lady O'Kalani on the record as the old lady. Very disrespectful. Did you know a lot of the teachers 
that have come to the University of Hawaii system for their degrees are taking classes from us. They're now going back to Kamehameha schools and looking at the situation going, that's an insurgent. That's an insurgent. Whoa. That's what's happening. Yeah. It's quite amazing. Well, denationalization is to obliterate the national consciousness of an occupied state. Because that one came out, it didn't have it open. <laughs> now, the policy of denationalization. There you go, Hawaii. Up the right on. That's right. <laughs> That's a good one. This is Kavaiola, the water of life, education. <laughs> so this is the policy now. Not just in Kamehameha schools, this is the policy that's going to be done throughout all the schools of Hawaii, including the private schools. So put out in 1906 by the Department of Public Instruction, Program for Patriotic Exercises, 1906. The theme of the program was to indoctrinate the children of Hawaii to believe they're American and to speak English. And if you speak Hawaiian, which is the national language, you get beaten. Now when you say Hawaiian, speaking Hawaiian, did you know Chinese people back then, children were speaking Hawaiian? Because that, remember, that's the national language of the country. That's not the language of the natives in Kalapana. That's the language of the country, and the laws were both in English and Hawaiian. So Chinese were speaking Hawaiian, like Chinese would speak French in France, Spanish in Spain. So not only the natives were beaten, our great-grandparents, or our grandparents, my grandparents, but also children that were Haole, who were Hawaiian. Children who were black and Hawaiian. So what ends up happening is the parents are not talking Hawaiian anymore, Otherwise, their children will continue to be beaten. That was the decision that was made. So a lot of our parents, my dad would say, yeah, every time we come around and they're talking Hawaiian, go, go, go be outside. And then they all talk Hawaiian. Not that they're talking Hawaiian because they're trying to be different, because that's the natural way to communicate. And then they tell their children, be good American. Just play the game, play the game. It's called survival. That's what it was. And to me, that's important to know, because if you don't speak Hawaiian today, it's okay, because here's why, right? It's a bigger problem as to how we need to bring it back. As a national language, not as a native language, right? That's what's important. Because the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom are also in Hawaiian. So we need to know what those laws are. Now, in 1906, you also had a reporter that came to Hawaii from New York, from Harper's Weekly Magazine. Harper's Weekly came to Hawaii to do a story on this. It's brainwashing. Kind of amazing, huh? Doing a story on brainwashing. And then they visited three schools. Ka'iolani Public School, grades 1 through 8. Ka'ahumanu Public School, 1 through 8. And Honolulu High School, which the name was changed in 1911 to President William McKinley High School. Part of the denationalization. So Harper's Weekly Magazine came and they visited Ka'iolani Public School. They had 714 school children. 714 of them, grades 1 through 8. The reporter says, at the command of the principal, they all stood up at attention, 714 school children, and start marching, drilling ceremony. And he's commenting how there's so much precision. See, when I was in the army, I saw guys walking, marching with two left feet. He had children right on, start off with the left foot and going. And then they line up in front of the flag at the command of the principal. They salute. Like that. There they are. And then at the command of the principal, they yell out, we give our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. <clears throat> this scene shows a salute to the American flag which flies in the grounds of the Kabiwa Public School which has many Japanese pupils. The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. Inculcate. Inculcate by definition is brainwashing through repetition. That's what it is. That's inculcate. You guys can look it up. Inculcating American patriotism in the children. Now imagine, this is my tutu's generation. 
My two tooth grand my two tooth parents were born in the eighteen eighties. My great grandfather, Napo Opo. Imagine, because I have two kids, I'm grown up now. My son was there learning how to be Russian. And he kind of did nothing. Oh yeah. Which kind of leads to some problems that start to arise called substance abuse. No jobs. Did you know that McKinley High uh, Honolulu High School, in this article, the reporter makes a comment. He says, at the grade school, you can see all the hues, hues means uh, color, all the hues of humanity, especially brown and yellow. That's, that's what he said, brown and yellow. But he said at the high school, they prevent them from coming up because you have to speak perfect English and you have to be white. And then he said the population of Honolulu High School, all white. Remember Willie Kawhi was talking about white supremacy? Okay, this is part of that process. So my papa, when he finished eighth grade, out of grade school, guess where he went? Work. You gotta go work. A lot of our people were manual laborers. It moved from education that we had to survival. You can't make money, how to get a house, how to live, frustration, unemployment. Now you take a look at the native Hawaiian population that exists today, it's not how it was in 1893. Highest incarceration in jail, there used to be a social worker, Queen Levy, Uka and Children's Son. I'm a jack of all trades. <laughs> Substance abuse, spouse abuse, or you name it, we own it. The problem is it wasn't back then. Something happened. So all of a sudden, dysfunction has become a culture. We gotta break that cycle, right? But what I'm pointing to is where it's coming from. Yeah. So I know it's a sad issue, but to me, it's a relief because now I know why I don't know. See, that's what's good. That's the first start, is to know why you don't know. And then you can begin to know. And not blame anybody for not knowing. Because you know what, we all didn't know. Well, this uh, uh, novelist that I love his quote, he says, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. <laughs> Did you know I used to be referred to as a lunatic back in the mid-1990s when I'm saying the same thing? The only difference now, I got three alphabets at the end of my name. And I get to grade, you have to come in my class. <laughs> and I get to sit in your doctor committee to either pass you or not pass you. So this lunatic hasn't changed. I guess everybody has become educated. People have become aware. So we have all become lunatics. <laughs> or lunatics. <laughs> <laughs> so, this was the build up to the now what? Yeah. Well, now what? What do we do about this information? Well, we gotta fix the problem. But before we can fix the problem, we need to understand the problem. It's called a diagnosis, right? It's like somebody diagnosed us with a, a headache and then we found out we had actually had a broken leg. And obviously these two Tylenols every day is not working. And that leg that was broken, it didn't set right. So you're kind of walking like this now. You know what happens though? How you fix a leg that didn't set right? You got it, break it again. Everybody grab a piece of wood and bite. Okay, I feel better. We're going to that right now, that initial crack, right? Others have gone through that crack before, but we all have to go through it. We have to accept the fact we can't change history, but we can understand history and move forward. And if anything that we can do is to ensure that we can be like our kupuna world with aloha, with respect, responsibility, but don't mistake aloha for weakness, because I will kill you with a law. <laughs> I'm serious, but I'm only killing your paradigm. <laughs> Not you physically. But that's how we have to approach it. And also we have to learn how to smile more, right? You know, that's the beginning of healing. In classes up at the university, it's funny to watch this realization happen at the end of the semester, because we're just finishing U8 semester. This week is the last week. In my class, Introduction to the Hawaiian Kingdom, all oh, the students are like, eyeballs are like, I got it. But when they first started, it was crawl. 
walk. Now you're running. And they saw it, but it took me a whole semester. So you folks are getting it in about two hours. Just packed, right? I just want to make sure that you come away with information to know this is real. We're not making this stuff up. And people are doing what they have to do to make it right. So what was overthrown in 1893 was what? The government. Okay. Now, if the government was overthrown, what still exists? The state, the country, the Hawaiian Kingdom has a state. Okay. Now, we have the state of Hawaii that exists here, which was created by a... Well, no, they're not insurgents yet. They're successors of insurgents. Because, see, hey, I work in the state of Hawaii, too. I work at Hawaii Community <laughs> College in the UH. And I'm actually in receipt of pillage monies from Hawaii folks pay taxes. <laughs> I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I'm part of this problem, just like everybody else is. It's like a, a web. You pull one part, everybody moves, right? So as long as we know that we are all part of the problem, okay, there's a way to fix this problem. So it's not an insurgency, it's just comprised of people who have been denationalized, right? And what we're doing is we're renationalizing. We're raising awareness, irrespective of race, color, creed, or nationality. And at the university, you know who gets this information the quickest? They go, ah, I got it. People not from Hawaii. Oh, you got Hawaiians? Oh, they pissed. Oh, yeah. They get angry. A uh, holy from California says, got it. The Hawaiian is going, wait, wait, what, 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 what? Remember one time there was this situation I was in. It was a non-traditional student. Non-traditional student is a people who go back to school after uh, retirement, right? And this person was in her 60s, auntie so-and-so, I just say auntie Lehuhe, which is in her name, but just let's give her a name, auntie Lehuhe, was in my class, and I'm giving a lecture about Hawaii being occupied, and blah, 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 and I could see a blood vessel, boom, 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 boom. Uh, she lived on Hawaiian homelands in Romanalo, retired from the military, and uh, she did not like what I was saying. And that's normal, because that's called denationalization. That's, you're proving my point. <laughs> so, but, see, when you teach, see, I can see all you folks, you know, but you folks can't see each other. So I can see body language. I can see eyes getting crossed. I can see blood vessels. I can see knees going like this, shaking. My job, as our job at the university is to bring everybody in. Because remember, they pay the tuition to pay classes. So you gotta find a way to draw them in. So what happened with this anti people here? I said, okay, let's say all you folks here, after I just presented this information to you, um, you don't believe me. Hawaii is not occupied. Does that work for or against me? And their response was, well, it works against you because you got to try to convince me. I said, well, actually, I don't have to convince you. Remember, I went back to the idea of rhetoric. I'm not arguing with you. I'm just showing you. Then I said, oh, let me, let me take it further. I said, auntie, auntie, behold it. Let's say KITV puts you on camera in the morning, and you go on morning, good morning, Hawaii, on KITV, and you start blasting this information. And you start saying, Kiang Sai is so nuts, we gotta lock him up, he's crazy, this is America, blah, blah, blah. And she's on for one month. Then I tell the class, ask the class, now does that work, does that work for or against me? <laughs> well, you gotta try to convince everybody. Nope, actually works for me. And they're all puzzled, what do you mean? So I'm gonna show you later, I was able to go to the World Court, Permanent Court of Arbitration, which I already showed this class, and I said, this is how it works for me. I'm going to take a DVD of NTV Hawaii ranting on KITV. I'm going to, next time I said, you know I went to the World Court, they go, yeah, you saw it. I said, well, let's take it back there. I'm going to pull out a television, TV, monitor, put in the DVD, and play anti. And what I say is, this is evidence of indoctrination. Because I can prove anti is not even American. And all of a sudden, he went, Whoa. So I said, remember the Miranda rights? 
anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. Be careful what you say, because it could be used against you. All of a sudden, Auntie's blood vessel, boom, 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 boom. Now it's normal. Then we proceeded. But these are the kind of things that we have to deal with in classes when you have somebody just not going there. You got to find a way to pull them in. And then she became a great student, you know? So these are the kind of things that we have to go through to, to, to get people aware and get them educated. Now once they're educated, they're going to go, well, how do we know what is what? Well, first of all, the state of Hawaii. State of Hawaii is not an art, state of Hawaii is not an insurgency, but it is an, a successor of an insurgency, right? It's an institution. Now what created the state of Hawaii? 1959, a municipal law, right? A municipal law. So the municipal law, public law 87-3, was established by Congress. Does it have any effect outside of its territory? So what do you call the state of Hawaii today then? If it's not a government whose authority came from Congress, but it still exists, you still got police officers, you still got me as a teacher, you got professors who get paid by pillage monies, but it, it still exists. You need to understand what is that under international law. So what international law defines the state of Hawaii is as an armed force. Actually it falls under Article 1 of the Hague Convention, armed force. Who has an allegiance to the United States, it's not a government. So state of Hawaii basically is in effective control of 94% of Hawaiian territory. Before you can administer the laws of the occupied state, there is a, a preceding article to Article 43, it's Article 42, it says you must be in control or effective control of the territory. Because if you're not in effective control, how can you administer the laws? Right? How do you execute the law? How do you hold somebody accountable? You gotta have some kind of control, right? So the United States was in control since 1893, but they managed to push that control onto the territory and then onto the state of Hawaii. So the state of Hawaii as an armed force is in effective control of 94% of Hawaii. The other 6% are military bases, 118 military bases around Hawaii. But they're in effective control here, right? That is a prerequisite where a military armed force can actually become a military government. It actually can become a military government. So, effective control establishes an obligation to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom under Article 43. And this is my talk that I had with Mike McCartney, Chief of Staff of Governor Egan, three years ago. The governor of the state of Hawaii to establish military government by declaring martial law. I mean, if they declare martial law, that doesn't mean the entire government is military. It's just like in 1941, December 7th, December 8th, December 8th, Point Dexter declared martial law. But see, Point Dexter, as the governor, could not declare martial law because he was appointed by the president. Back then, territorial governors were not elected. They were appointed. So he, he needed permission from Roosevelt to declare martial law. So he got authority. When he declared martial law, he replaced himself with General uh, Short to become the military governor. And everyone in the territorial government remained except for legislative bodies were suspended. Executive and judicial branches remained. All you had was a military governor. That is what is called a military government, also called martial law. That same situation happens in foreign countries when they're invaded. So when Saddam Hussein's government was overthrown, okay, that Saddam Hussein's government was replaced by a coalition provisional authority that was made up of a military governor that replaced Saddam Hussein as the executive, but every other entity stayed in place in Iraq, the Iraqi government. And that's called a military government. So some people get the idea of military government, it's all military. No, it's just the head. That's all it is. And we have to comply with the law of occupation, the Hague and Geneva Conventions. <clears throat> so Governor Ige can actually do it. Any government. Because under the state of Hawaii constitution and bylaws, it's not a government, but it's an organization, it can declare martial law without permission from the president, because that changed in 1959. They don't have to wait for the U.S. president to agree. They can do it on their own. And by declaring martial law, he would replace himself 
with a military governor. The military governor would be the adjutant general of the Hawaiian Hawaii National Guard, Aaron Guard. And that person there, not to say it's going to be him, right now it's held by uh, General Logan. He's a police officer on Oahu, but he's also a two-star general. He has experience and training in the military because they deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. As a two-star general, he went to war college. War college means you learn the law of occupation. FM 27-10, FM 27-5, Hague and Geneva Convention, it's all there. It's called regulations. He would be the one that, is off, that had the quality or qualification to step in and protect protected persons. So just like Jennifer was speaking to protected persons, the military governor already knows that. That's all inherent in the law of occupation. So the judicial and executive branches are maintained except for the legislature and county council. Military governor is both executive and legislative authority, and the military governor can issue a proclamation that all laws illegally imposed in Hawaii since 1893 will be recognized as the provisional laws of the occupied state so long as these laws do not run contrary to the letter, spirit, and intent of Hawaiian Kingdom law. So if the Hawaiian Kingdom was still in operation, guess what, we're gonna have driver's license today. If the Hawaiian Kingdom was still in operation, we're gonna have regulations of uh, pesticides, right? And all the old laws still in play, because the only tax that you will pay would be, have to be consistent with Hawaiian law, which would be the law, the, the taxes that are paid to the state of Hawaii, which is the military government now, to maintain services. Because that's the same system from 1893. What you don't apply is IRS taxes. All of a sudden, the Jones Act. You guys have ever heard of the Jones Act? The Jones Act is a law passed by Congress to protect the merchant marines. So only American flagships can distribute goods. So what happens is, in the Pacific, ships with goods pass Hawaii, pass Hawaii, go to the port of Los Angeles, offload, and then Matson heads out there with some cargo they're gonna offload in LA, normally they're like half loaded, go there, reload, and come back, and we eat the cost. That's the Jones Act. Jones Act was passed by Congress, which is a, municipal law, limited to the United States. So that means Hawaii's treaties with other countries, those ships come directly into Honolulu Harbor or Kauai or Hilo. That's how it works. Just like how it happened in 1893. Oh, all of a sudden, cost of living is dropping. So it's a lot easier living in Hawaii. Willie, Dr. Kauai talked about the diaspora. Hawaiians living abroad, guess what? Not even going to be coming home, right? Under Hawaiian Kingdom law, Queens Hospital, healthcare, no cost for natives. That's an institution. That's called universal healthcare. So there's a lot of benefits here, but we just don't know it. And that's why research is so important at the university to make sure we dot the I across the T's and not come out with an argument of what we think. We say, here it is. Here's a white paper. Tells it tells you exactly what it is. But these are the rules that have to be done. Now, it hasn't happened yet. And everybody's waking up to this stark reality of war crimes. So what we needed to do back then, because I kind of woke up from my sleep uh, about 1994. And actually, I knew this back then. Uh, Donovan Prezzo, uh, I, I, I did a presentation that was filmed by Namakoka Aina in 1998 at Queen Lilith Wokalani Children's Center in Hilo. And uh, Joe Nander and Pui Pao filmed it. And it was four and a half hours, Kiyamu Sai and Hawaiian Kingdom Law. Donovan tells me, hey, I, I saw this at uh, St. Clair Library, the, the, the DVD. So he said he checked it out, and it has me. There's a screen, back then, no PowerPoint. It was an overhead projector with transparencies. Yeah, Xerox copies of original documents. And I'm walking everybody through. Donovan tells me, man, I can't believe it. You said the same thing, the only difference is you got three letters after your name. And that was 1998. Now, 1994 is when I woke up. We had to try to figure out how do we deal with this situation. It's like everybody's still sleeping in the plane. And I'm going, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like, what the hell? Well, the one thing I knew was we need to do something to bring out the Hawaiian Kingdom, the state, the state. Now you folks understand, right? The, 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 these topics, these terms that are so important. So we need to bring out the state. How do you bring out the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state? You need a government. Otherwise, you're just talking history. 
You need a government to move it, right? You need a government to speak on its behalf. The Hawaiian Kingdom as a state has been silent since 1893. We've got to do something. So the one thing that we learned in the military, try to look at other situations that are similar to yours and draw from that. If, these guys, if this battle was fought this way, try to find other places that fought similar battles and how they won. Just don't limit yourself to one particular style of fighting. Well, in the Army, a private can become a lieutenant. It's called acting lieutenant. Assume the chain of command. And actually, that is a requirement. It is not a choice. And if they choose not to do it, it's called time and grade. Who was in the longest? Take the chain of command. Because you have to maintain the command structure. And when the property commission officer comes to relieve you, you go back down being a private. That's how it works. We did it in the Army all the time. I found out that you could actually do that with governments. Because when I started to look into World War II, provisional governments, called governments in exile, that gave me some ideas. One particular situation was Belgium. So Belgium was invaded by the Nazis. Belgium and Luxembourg. King Leopold was captured by the Nazis. Belgians fled, went into London, and they formed a government in exile. And what they did was they assumed these cabinet positions, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Finance, and other ministers that work under the king. Under the Belgian constitution, there was a provision that when the king is absent, the cabinet can become a council of regency. Regency is not a monarchy. Regency is an entity that serves in the absence of a monarch. So these Belgians formed a council of regency under their constitution to assume the role of the monarch who was captured by the Nazis. Now, did you know that that article in the Belgian constitution is nearly identical to Article 33 of the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution. That's when I went, whoa, because Belgium was a monarchy. Hawaiian Kingdom was a monarchy. Both were constitutional. So here, we said, we can formulate a way to assume the chain of command of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of the Interior, and the Attorney General, and form a Council of Regency to provisionally represent the Hawaiian state. You guys caught that? If Belgians can do it, under their rules, why can't we do it under our rules? It's nearly identical. And I know the doctrine of necessity allows that. That's what allows a private person to become a public official. So the question is, don't you have to have a king? Actually, under, or a king, but actually under a constitutional system, it's not the person of the queen or the king, and Donovan brought that up, it's the office of the king or the queen. That's what's different, because a constitutional system is separating the person from the office. Does that make sense? So the queen is not in the physical body, the queen is in the office. And who can fill that office is dependent upon the municipal laws of that particular country, in the case Hawaii and in that case Belgium. Okay. So the point that I'm making is we're able to do that why reinvent the wheel, is adjust it a bit, and we actually formed the Council of Regency, an entity to serve in the absence of a monarch, serving in a very similar fashion as a government in exile, but we didn't go in exile, we did it here. Because the Belgians could have made their Council of Regency in Belgium, in Brussels, and what they do is they monitor the Nazis to ensure they comply with the law of occupation, but chances are they'll probably get shot. That's why they went into exile, right? Here, we're not gonna get shot. Nobody's even going to know what we're doing because everybody's still sleeping. <laughs> I'm serious, but don't go wrong. You guys still sleeping, but what I do, if I screw up and I put it on record, that thing will haunt me later because this could be treason on me. Even when you guys are all sleeping. Because when you wake up, the law is still the law. So it's called vicarious liability. That's why privates don't like to be lieutenants, acting lieutenant, because they carry vicarious liability in making decisions as if they're a commission officer. That's why he said, oh, I don't want to make, I don't want to take that move. We took the move. Our function was to expose the occupation of Hawaii. Three things. Expose the occupation, ensure compliance to the law of occupation, and prepare for an effective transition of when the occupation comes to an end. That's all it does. It doesn't tell anybody what to do, because it can't, it has no effective control. Yeah? We're not the occupied, we're the occupied. 
We acknowledge that, Article 43. Now we're going to say war crimes. Now we're going to start documenting. Now we're going to get ready for prosecution. That's what the Belgians did with regard to the occupation of Belgium by Germany. A lot of information, racking it up. That's all we're doing. So what we did was we represented not the people, we represented the Hawaiian state. And through the Hawaiian state, the people as protected persons under the Geneva Convention. That's how it works. International law, because we're occupied. So, the test came in 1999, four years after the acting government was formed, the Council of Regency, on December 15, 1995. Permanent Court of Arbitration. There's now a dispute between a Hawaiian subject and the Council of Regency. This Hawaiian subject named Lance Larson, he's from uh, Mountain View, was sitting in a presentation I gave in 1998. I am explaining about Hawaiian Kingdom Law. You gotta follow Hawaiian Kingdom Law. So he says, really, you gotta follow Hawaiian Kingdom Law. Yep, I understand the problem, I understand the difficulties, but in my position, my job is to say you gotta follow Hawaiian Kingdom Law. But hey, I understand. He decides to take it full tilt, and he realizes that Hawaiian Kingdom Law did not have a statute on driver's licenses and registration on motor vehicles. Why would you think that? Because it worked then. Because you didn't have cars in 1893. <laughs> so there was no municipal law on law, I mean on cars, on driver's license. So he said, okay, so he took off his license plates, took off his safety sticker, registration, put a big placard on the back of his truck, all on his own, restating section six of the Hawaiian Civil Code that says, the laws are obligatory upon all persons, whether subjects of his kingdom or citizens or subjects of any foreign state while within the limits of this kingdom. And he started going around Hilo, driving, and he got a lot of tickets. And I know that police officer, they gave him all those tickets, Officer Leland Pa. <laughs> well, little did he know, he just sparked the situation that will take itself and catapult it to the world court. So during his trial, and he's represented by an attorney, named Ian Parks, and his position was because there's no treaty, right? remember treaty, back of treaty, he has to follow Hawaiian Kingdom law. He can't follow Hawaii Vice Statutes, which is American law, because if he does, he'll be committing treason against the Hawaiian Kingdom. So this is the attorney presenting that argument. Then I get brought in by the attorney to be an expert witness, in this case, about Hawaiian Kingdom law and international law. So, Judge Sandra Shuey was a judge, and the way you become an expert witness, you just don't declare it, you gotta go up, cite your credentials or your knowledge as to how you know what you know, and then you get for the or the prosecutor starts to ding you to try to show you're not an expert. That's how it works. So Judge Sandra Shuey, after I kept answering the prosecutor's questions, like straight up, she said, stop. Mr. Saez, he's an expert in this area. He's, he's accepted as an expert witness. So first time I was brought in as an expert witness on this topic before I even had a master's degree or a PhD. But again, remember, I'm saying the same thing, just three letters at the end of my name. <laughs> so then I'm explaining on the witness stand that this is the old courthouse by Kiao, yeah, Foodland, the police station. Yeah, not the one in Hilo. This one is in 1998. Yeah. So Judge Sandra Shuri is getting caught because Minia and Lance Larson is saying the right things, right? and asking the right questions. So, she, she uh, called, her, called, in to, uh, called a break on this, went into her chambers and started thinking. She came back out and she said, uh, I've come to a decision, I'm gonna fine you $900. So she asked Lance Larson, are you gonna pay that? And he said, no, you didn't show me the treaty. And she said, that's what I thought you said. So she ordered him to be incarcerated, 30 days, seven days solitary confinement. Yeah, I'm watching this whole thing. Like, ooh. The attorney, Ninia Parks, was concerned that was going to get beaten up in the prison. Because why would you throw the, not the book, the car, on a traffic situation? 30 days, 7 days solitary confinement. What she just did there was violate Article 147 of the Geneva Convention. Grave breaches which are war crimes committed against protected persons. One, failure to provide a fair and regular trial. Two, unlawful confinement. These are two war crimes. Ninia Parks then turns to me. She changed now because she's concerned for Lance. She says, you, 
The Council of the Regents is responsible for my client's protection. <laughs> now I know you're right, because remember vicarious liability, right? We said, no, you're right. But we're not in effective control, the United States is. So we accept, yes, we are responsible, but we're not liable because of occupation. So she uh, tried to get her client out of prison through a habeas corpus by filing a complaint in federal court in Honolulu. And Judge Samuel King was a judge. Does anybody remember Judge Samuel King? He was actually part of Hawaii, but he was a federal judge, right? So this case was before Judge Samuel King. Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States and the United Nations. The United Nations files a response saying they got diplomatic immunity, so they're removed off the docket. And then Minya Parks approaches me, because I'm uh, the chairman of the Council of Regency, I'm the, Minister of the, the acting Minister of the Interior, and she tells me that she got word that the U.S. Attorney is making a move to submit a motion to dismiss the case. And she said, the Council of the Region is still liable for the protection of my client. I understand. But I said, Nenia, this court, federal court here in Honolulu, is just as illegal as the court in Paul, well, actually, Kiel. Yeah. Because both courts were established by <coughs> municipal <laughs> laws of the United States, which has no application to Hawaii. So I said, this case has to go to a, a court that does have, that has jurisdiction called the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands. And one of the parties has to be a state. Let's go there. So what I recommended to her, dismiss the United States off the docket so they can't file a motion to dismiss. And we will enter into a binding stipula a stipulation of agreement for binding arbitration. And then Judge Samuel King signed off on it. So it leaped from, from federal court in Honolulu to the permanent court of arbitration in the Netherlands in, on November 8, 1999. So that's how you can see how this worked. Now this is all football. You see how it's being played out when you know how to play the game? Actually people do their part to get it done. So the permanent court of arbitration is an intergovernmental organization that creates ad hoc tribunals, meaning tribunals that are not, they're existing but are created, that's what ad hoc is, depending on the dispute. So if the dispute, the international dispute deals with um, armaments, then you bring in arbitrators that have experience in armaments. If it's a dispute that deals with occupation, you bring in arbitrators that have experience in arbitration. That way, their decision is binding on the parties because the parties know that the experts are not just the experts, but also the judges. That's why arbitration is a very familiar way to do dispute resolution at the international level. Yeah? Not going through a court and bringing in expert witnesses, because in a court, the judge is not the expert. He's just the referee. In arbitration, the judge or the arbitrators are both judges and the experts. That's what makes arbitration unique. And the Permanent Court of Arbitration was formed in 1899, the Hague Convention Number 1. And it was made so that countries can resolve their disputes so they don't go to war. But if you do go to war, then you use the Hague Convention Number 2 and 3, which regulates the war. So the PCA has what is called institutional jurisdiction for the following disputes. One of the parties has to be a state. So you have a dispute between two states. Here we have Ecuador versus the United States of America, 2011. The U.S. goes to the Permanent Court of Arbitration to resolve disputes. And before the uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration can form a tribunal, they have to verify the parties, or one of them is a state. So if you look at the bottom, it says names of claimant, the Republic of Ecuador state, the United States of America state. And so that then moves to formation of the ad hoc tribunal for that particular dispute on that treaty and, uh, interpretation. Next is between a state and an international organization. In this case, this is Peru versus the United Nations Office for Project Services. It identifies the claimant, Peru, as a state, the UN as an international organization. Then they form the tribunal. Now here we come with between a state and a private entity. Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. You notice they identify Lance Larson okay, as a private entity, the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state. That is heavy. But people didn't, remember nobody knew football. This is profound. That is proof positive we're in the game and we're playing. Right? 
And we don't need everybody to support because the provisional government was not made by elections because you cannot have elections during occupation. It's similar to how other governments were formed in exile, right? So the issue there was about Lance Larson and whether or not the Hawaiian government is liable for the allowing the unlawful imposition of American municipal laws over him. Again, you hear that, see the use of municipal laws, right? Remember that term, keep it in mind. That's everything that's here is now being addressed. So the question then is, can he proceed without the United States involvement? Because the United States actually was invited to join in the arbitration. In fact, during these proceedings, now I'm the lead agent for the Hawaiian Kingdom government. I'm representing the Hawaiian Kingdom in these proceedings. Before the tribunal was formed, made up of three arbitrators, two of them became judges on the International Court of Justice, I was contacted by the Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration after they reviewed all the paperwork. Right? Jennifer referred to that. They reviewed, to docu they reviewed documents, exchange of notes that were taking place. So he calls me, and it's 11 hour difference. So it's like 11 o'clock at night. And he says, um, just wanted to let the Hawaiian government know that the Permanent Court of Arbitration has done their due diligence and they cannot find any evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom does not exist. That's what he said. Because only the government was overthrown, not the kingdom. And then he also said, he acknowledged that the Hawaiian Dutch treaty, the Hawaiian treaty with the Netherlands, where the court is located, has not been canceled. That is what he's telling me. Then he says, his words specifically, he says, in order to maintain the integrity of this case, he would highly recommend that the Hawaiian government provide a formal invitation to the United States to join in the arbitration. I went, that's a good recommendation. Because <laughs> remember, we're the defendants in this case. Why am I going to ask them to come in to explain their actions so Lance Larson can hold us accountable? Remember, we're the defendants. This is Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. We're not the moving party. We're not coming after Lance Larson. He's coming after us for him getting locked up and his rights are being violated. I mean, he also sue us for money. That's what it is. But I went, no, that's a good point. Let me talk to the Council of the Regency. Let's see if we can invite the United States. But you notice he asked the government to provide the recommendation, not Lance Larson's attorney. I said, okay, so the meeting was set up for March 3rd, 2000 in Washington, D.C. Both Ninia Parks and I flew to Washington, had a meeting with John Crook at the U.S. State Department, and he was caught. He had all the information in front of him. He had it for a couple of days at the meeting. And he said, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration accepted this case? Because you've got to be a state to accept. You know? In fact, it was the Secretary General that recommended that my government provide this formal invitation to the United States to join in the arbitration. And that's when he began to watch his P's and Q's. Oh, yeah. Because I said, I want to take this conversation and put it in writing. I'll send it to you as to what we discussed, and I'm going to carbon copy the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands to show formal invitation was provided as recommended by the Secretary General. So we did that, came back home. Well, maybe uh, two weeks later, I get a call from the Deputy Secretary General, Phyllis Hamilton, and she's an American citizen who's at the court. Uh, the Secretary General is a Dutch citizen. So um, she calls me and says that they received word from the American Embassy on answering the invitation and that the United States respectfully declines to join in the arbitration. I said, okay, but they have a counteroffer. But could they have access to all records and pleadings of the case? Now, you know that counteroffer, what he just did? He just asked the Hawaiian government permission to have access to the records. That's called recognition. Now, it's not like diplomatic recognition. You needed permission from us to get the records. And we said, not a problem. Everything is open. Open all the windows. Nobody's hiding anything. You're more than welcome to have a look at anything we do. And it's also open to all other countries. So we made it open. Yeah. And uh, transparency is so important. right? So uh, that's when uh, oral hearings were set in December of 2000 for three days. And uh, let's see if that works. So uh, Primo, we'll see if the sound works. Oh, sorry. 
There's me as the agent. <laughs> okay, so here's the case. Uh, mini documentary. So that's me over there with the beard, trying to look distinguished. <laughs> I got him always say, shave that beard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I tried to take the attention away from here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Peace Palace. So the International Court of Justice, the UN, is here. And the Permanent Court of Arbitration is here. The Permanent Court of Arbitration, 1899. International Court of Justice, 1946. Okay, see if it works. You may know that one. Oh, perfect. In summary, from 1840, the Hawaiian Kingdom possessed a constitutional government with elected and appointed officials and a complete system of civil and criminal laws to govern Hawaiian territory. On April 8, 1842, King Commander III and Privy Council commissions three envoys to secure international recognition of Hawaiian independence. And these individuals are Timoteo Ha'alilil, William Richards, and Sir George Simpson. On December 19, 1842, Hawaiian envoys secured the United States President Tyler's recognition of Hawaiian independence. November 28, 1843, the British government and the French government formally entered into a declaration recognizing Hawaiian independence. In our pleadings, we refer to that as the 1843 Anglo-Franco Proclamation. From that point, Hawaii has had its statehood recognized as being independent. As such, it began to enter into these treaties. Austria, Hungary, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, <coughs> Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Russia, Spain, and the United States of America. International recognition is evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom had diplomatic representatives as of 1893 from those countries, as far as consulates and embassies. Rather, what we find is that the United States has never expressed, it, expressed itself as an occupier. Who would? It would never admit to occupation. But yet, to admit to occupation, is in a sense to admit to the continued existence of the Hong Kong as an independent state, which is really the crux of the matter. Which is actually what is holding up, you might say, this issue to be resolved. Thus, the legal order. Thus, the reestablishment of the government. Thus, the relationship between its nationals. Uh, I mean, to be, to be slightly unkind, but thus the issue in Rem. The point is that if the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist, its existence is in rem. It's not in personam, or the Hawaiian existence, the, the Hawaiian Kingdom doesn't exist solely in the opinion of Mr. Larson. Right. But that existence should not be dependent upon an occupier. Because you basically put the occupier at it on an equal footing with the Hawaiian Kingdom in its own territory. So really what needs to be addressed is what came before the occupation whether the statehood or whether the legality or illegality of the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the illegality or legality of the United States as an occupier. Should the tribunal find it has jurisdiction, we are prepared to submit an offer of proof. We felt that this tribunal would offer some clarity so that for the first time we have a third party to present these type of merits that can be scrutinized by international law rather taking it before a United States tribunal, which could not rule on it to the detriment of itself. So in that sense, there is really no other way to address this issue. And the opportunity did arise, because it was Mr. Larson who was adhering to Hawaiian Kingdom law. And if the United States was adhering to occupation, not whether they're illegal or illegal, but if they were adhering to the laws of occupation, we wouldn't be here right now. And that was Linnea Parks that you saw, uh, the blonde haired Bohemian. She has an unbelievable story herself. Okay. But just before I get there, can you see what you can do when you know the game? 
you know how to play the game and you're playing the game with others who know how to play the game. Now the one part you heard Judge Crawford, who later became a judge on the International Court of Justice, in fact he's still on the International Court of Justice. Judge Greenwood is another one that you saw. He was on the International Court of Justice, just finished a 10 year term. That gives you the sense of the high caliber, the caliber of who is actually on this tribunal. You know? Well, when Judge Crawford said in rem, thus the issue in rem, as opposed to in personam, that, that, that's a legal jargon saying in rem, meaning it exists. It exists because the whole world accepts it exists because it exists. It doesn't exist in personam, in the opinion of Mr. Larson. It exists. And that's what he's referring to because we would not even be there to even have the hearing if the Hawaiian Kingdom did not continue to exist. The issue was whether or not the Hawaiian government was liable for damages that Lance Larson suffered from. Right? That's what the whole case was about. Now, here's a story, a quick story of Ninia Parks, and I'll continue with the case. Ninia was uh, adopted, and when she became of age, she wanted to find her birth parents. Right? She found out that her parents were from Hawaii. And she was in California, finished law school, and she found out that she's part Native Hawaiian. So she came to Hawaii, and that's what she wanted to just find family. Then she found out about Hawaii's history and began representing Hawaiian subjects, not people from sovereignty groups, Hawaiian subjects, like Lance Larson, right? The reason why she's going to represent Hawaiian subjects because she found out that her great 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 her great great grandfather was also an attorney in the Hawaiian Kingdom, Haole but Hawaiian, right? But Nini is native; she part native, but Haole but Hawaiian. And that person's name was William Kimi, K-I-N-N-E-Y. William Kimi was the insurgent that prosecuted Lili Okalani on that trumped up charge of misprison of treason under the Republic. So for Ninia, it was called making amends. Pretty heavy, huh? And that's how she was representing Hawaiian subjects. That's why she picked Hawaiian subjects under the Hawaiian kingdom of the country, not a group. And that's, that's it. she has an amazing story. Yeah. After she got back, she got tired of fighting all the time. She just wanted to have kids, got married to Hawaiian. She got like five kids. Lives in Macau and having a great time. <laughs> but this was her Kulian and look what she did. Now, in this case, the tribunal made a determination that they needed the United States president to answer to the allegations of Lance's rights being violated by the court. Because we didn't violate his rights, we're being held liable for the violation of his rights. That's like somebody getting beat up at Uncle, uh, Uncle Robert's over here by somebody, and uh, instead of uh, going after the guy who beat him up, they're going after Sam for allowing that guy to be on the premise. It's like a tort, a liability. That's what this case was about. We were not the ones who violated Lance Larson's rights, the United States did, through its courts and through its prison system. The question was whether or not the Hawaiian government is liable for those violations. But you have the United States, you gotta have them there to answer to the allegations because what rights were violated in order to know what we're liable to. Was it unfair trial? Was it unlawful confinement? Was it something else? You know, but it can't happen if the United States is not participating. Because the court doesn't have subpoena power. So what they call that is an indispensable third party rule. It's a, it's, it's a court proceeding rule. So they explain it here. It follows that the tribunal cannot determine whether the respondent, the Hawaiian government, has failed to discharge its obligations toward the claimant, Mr. Larson, without ruling on the legality of the acts of the United States. Yet that is precisely what the monetary gold principle, which is another court case in the ICJ, precludes or prevents the tribunal from doing. As the International Court explained in another case, East Timor, the court could not rule on the lawfulness of the conduct of a state, of the United States, no, uh, the conduct of the Hawaiian Kingdom, when its judgment would imply an evaluation of the lawfulness of the conduct of another state, the United States, which is not a party to the case. So this case was not about whether or not the Hawaiian Kingdom exists, it was about whether or not Lance Lar Larson can sue the Hawaiian government without the United States participating. So we basically are going to win this case. Lance Larson cannot prevail without the United States. But what the tribunal pointed out was 
the indispensable third party rule does not apply in another type of a proceeding at the permanent court of arbitration. And that's called fact finding. Fact finding at the permanent court of arbitration, there have only been five of them so far at that level since 1899. And fact finding commission of inquiry does not get into arbitral disputes, it gets into serving similar to a grand jury where you look at the facts and you sign, assign criminal liability for prosecution by another entity. So it's like a grand jury, okay? So in this case, they can see who is liable for locking up Lance Larson, for providing an unfair trial with the facts and assign liability for prosecution for war crimes by another court. That's the fact finding. So they state here in its arbitration award, at one stage of the proceedings, the question was raised whether some of the issues which the parties wish to present might not be dealt with by way of fact finding. In addition to its role as a facilitator of international arbitration and conciliation, the Permanent Court of Arbitration has various procedures for fact finding, both as between states and otherwise, a state and a private entity. Okay? A request that the tribunal should reconstitute itself as a fact finding commission would have raised a number of issues. A new compromise or agreement would presumably be made or required, and blah, blah, blah. So basically, it said, you guys can go this route. So I'm, hmm. okay. Now, we're not eager to go to fact finding. Well, plus, we could be held liable. Remember, we're still the defendants in here, so we're not excited about moving and, oh, yeah, let's, let's have him come after us. Maybe we're liable for not doing anything as well as the United States. See, that's where we're at here. But we already made an initial agreement to settle this dispute, and you know what, let's go fact finding. So we actually discussed it when it came out. But the problem was cost. The cost for these proceedings, $150,000. Uh, it's gonna be another 150 at least for fact finding. Where are we gonna get that money? And did you know, when Lance Larson signed the, arbit signed the arbitration agreement through his attorney with us, it was on condition, because he's coming after us, he covers the cost. He didn't cover the cost of $150,000. His attorney opened the account at the gate, and monies came from undisclosed people and put in, and I heard that it came from those descendants of missionaries that were also trying to make right, like me Young. That's where the money came from. So for moving toward fact finding, another 150,000, I said, well, let's think about that. Let's think about it. Because one thing that we deal with right off the bat, people back home are clueless as to what happened in the year 2000. This was 18 years ago. But you notice you can understand it after I explained everything beforehand. Yeah? Like it makes perfect sense now, but imagine you just saw it and you're going, what is this all about? You know? Who's this guy over there trying to talk like the king of still exists? He's living in reality? <laughs> well, education is key. So after the last day of hearings in The Hague, we were contacted by an ambassador from Rwanda, Dr. Bio Zagawa, who was at the court, at the International Court of Justice, attending a hearing on genocide between Congo and Belgium. Belgium was accusing the Congo Minister of Foreign Affairs for genocide, and was wondering whether or not, asking the court whether or not their arrest warrant, which is municipal, the arrest warrant had any effect beyond Belgian territory. That was the issue. They found out about our court case across the hall. So we got a call on the last day of the hearing to meet with the ambassador in Brussels, Belgium. So we caught the train, me and my legal team. The ambassador took us to this little cafe, totally bought out for two hours. Belgium, I mean, uh, Rwanda bought it out, so nobody's there. Just us, doors locked, shades down, lights on, having coffee. Ambassador is in front of me, Dr. Bills ago, and he says, his government has reviewed all the pleadings and records. Because remember I told you, the records were open, not just for the United States, for any country to have access. And he says that it is still always occupied. And that this cannot be tolerated, over a hundred, over a century. And then he said that he has been given the authority from the President, through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to him as the ambassador, to provide to the acting government of the Hawaiian Kingdom that, that Rwanda is prepared to report to the United Nations General Assembly puts on the agenda Hawaii's occupation and bring in compliance and ultimately bring it to an end. So I'm sitting in front of the ambassador and I'm looking at him and you've got to play poker face, right? Inside of mine. Yeah. 
You want to move from one mountain to another mountain? And I went, ooh. I went from, yeah, to ooh. So, uh, your excellency. Please excuse me, I need to talk to my legal team. So I turned around, we talked. Sat back down in front of the ambassador and I said, please convey to your president our sincere gratitude. But we cannot accept this offer at this stage. Our people back home have no clue of Hawaii status. None. We need to go home and begin the education. We have to deal with key nationalization. And he thanked me. I said, no, thank you. Well, it was decided by the Council of Regency that since I already had a bachelor's degree back in 1987 from UH Manor, I know what they're teaching up there. It's wrong. Indigenous, nativeness. Hey, native is good. But don't tie that into the country as if it's the national culture. Uh, Kanaka culture, I'm there. But don't make it like this was just natives. No, this was a multi-ethnic country, majority natives, and it's a native country. But it's legal, and it needs to be understood that way. So it was decided that I would go back to the University of Hawaii that very next month, enroll as an unclassified student, because I missed the application process for political science graduate program, start taking classes unclassified that would transfer over when I'm classified because when I get accepted into the school. Then I got my master's degree in political science specializing in international relations and my PhD. And I came up with a plan on how to fix this problem. That's how we're coming with this as I'm sharing, right? Now, we are going to follow international law to do what I just said. This is what prompted us. U.S. Army Field Manual 27-10, the Law of Land Warfare. Chapter 8, Remedies for Violation of International Law called War Crimes. Because any violation of the Hague and Geneva Convention is a war crime. And that's what was taken up at the court with Lance Larson. Those were war crimes. Remedies of an injured belligerent, that's us. In the event of violation of the law of war, the injured party may legally resort to remedial action of the following types. We're going to pick the first one. Publication of the facts with the view to influencing public opinion against the offending belligerent. That's where we're going. And that's fully recognized by the United States. Because that's an army field manual that I knew as an officer. So, we're going to hit academic publications when I'm at the University of Hawaii. And it's not limited to just natives, it's anybody. You know, anybody. Well, came out with an article, A Slippery Path Towards Hawaiian Indigeneity, an analysis and comparison between Hawaiian state sovereignty and Hawaiian indigeneity and its use in practice in Hawaii today. That is a journal of law and social challenges out of the University of San Francisco School of Law. This is a law review. Then it's going to start the ball rolling. My doctor dissertation, the American occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom, beginning the transition from occupied to restored state. Then followed up by Kamala Beamer, his doctoral dissertation. Willie Kauai, Kauai, to Southern, that's his doctoral dissertation. Kalani Makika Whitaker, he's a teacher at Kamehameha Schools, uh, KL campus. He has a PhD in education. All of this is on the Hawaiian Kingdom as a country. Lawrence Gunsher, his doctoral dissertation. Ron Williams, his doctoral dissertation. Donovan Preza, his master's thesis. And he's now in the doctoral program. Pretty soon he'll be having a doctoral dissertation. Patrick Dunbury from Switzerland, the Hawaiian Kingdom arbitration case and the unsettled question of the Hawaiian Kingdom's claim to continuity as an independent state under international law. They came out of the Chinese Journal of International Law. Noelia Nekudu Kaupua, uh, this is a Harvard publication, Hawaii, an occupied country. Kiala Kelly, the kingdom inside the future of Hawaiian political identity. Another larger article I put out, American occupation of the Hawaiian state. Matthew Craven from London, he's the Dean of the Law School at the University of London, Hawaii History and International Law. Professor Kanalu Young, an interdisciplinary study of the term Hawaiian. Professor at the University of Hawaii, passed away, but he's a, he's a legend back on campus amongst young Hawaiian uh, academics that are rising up. John Osorio, Ku'e and Ku'okoa, History, Law and Other Faiths. Umi Perkins, Honors History Teacher at Kamehameha Schools Kapalama. And Dennis Richards, a publication in a Japanese journal, academic journal, This Is Not America. The acting government of the Hawaiian Kingdom rules global with legal challenges to end the occupation. This is just a 
tip of the iceberg of academic research that is coming out that is going across the board. And it's pretty exciting. And it also is taking place outside of Hawaii. <clears throat> in Italy, it's going full blast over there. Yeah. In Italian records, Italian academic publications are correcting the fact that Hawaii was not annexed because everyone in Europe thought Hawaii was annexed by a treaty. They didn't know it was a joint resolution. That was part of the lie that is being debunked now within European academic circles. Now because of this type of research, it prompted a particular author of a book, Nation Within, named, named is Tom Kaufman. He published this book, Nation Within, The History of America's Annexation of the Nation of Hawaii. In 1998, the 100th anniversary of the so-called annexation. Is that true? America's annexation of the nation of Hawaii. You can't annex a foreign country by passing a law. But what did happen? What happened instead of annexation? Because America still was here. They occupied. So occupation is the issue, not annexation, right? Well, in 2009, Tom Kaufman, a very well-known historian, uh, changed his subtitle. Look at his subtitle now. The History of the American Occupation of Hawaii. Yeah. And he's an American, right? Well, let's, just, let's see why he made that change. A note on the second edition. I am, I am compelled to add that the continued relevance of this book reflects a far-reaching political, moral, and intellectual failure of the United States to recognize and deal with its takeover of Hawaii. In the book's subtitle, the word annexation has been replaced by the word occupation, referring to America's occupation of Hawaii. Where annexation connotes legality by mutual agreement, meaning a treaty, the act was not mutual and therefore not legal, since by definition of international law there was no annexation, we are then left with the word occupation. In making this change, I have embraced the logical conclusion of my research into the events of 1893 to 1898 in Honolulu and Washington. I am prompted to take this step by a growing body of historical work by a new generation of Native Hawaiian scholars. He's acknowledging all the research that has been coming out of the university. Dr. Keanu Sai writes, so he's taking that quote from my larger article. The challenge for the fields of political science, history, and law is to distinguish between the rule of law and the politics of power. In the history of Hawaii, the might of the United States does not make it right. And that's pretty profound for this author to do that. And Tom actually called me and explained why he did that. He said he's an American, and it was hard for him to swallow this. He knew it, but he knew it. He couldn't swallow it. He said, we at the university was prompting him to do it because information is coming out. And he just wanted to thank me. He said, no, thank you. So everybody has their part yeah, in doing all these different things, but you got to come from the same music sheet, right? And that's what everybody's doing. And when you come from the same music sheet, guess what? You can start composing songs. And that's what's happening here. And then, as Jennifer noted, uh, in February this year, the United Nations sent this uh, letter to the uh, judges of the state of Hawaii. I actually had a Skype meeting with this guy, Dr. Desaius, in Geneva, Switzerland. Well, it's all legit, yeah. But the one thing that Dr. Desaius didn't know was about Hawaii being occupied and being an independent state. He thought that Hawaii was, should be on a list of non-self-governing territories and a right to self-determination. No, no, we're occupied compliance to the Hague and Geneva Conventions. That's what applies. And that's when he states here, <clears throat> I have come to understand, that's a telling statement, because he didn't know that before, because I read his report in 2013. He didn't refer to Hawaii as an occupied state, he referred to it as a colonial institution. Uh, I've come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation state in continuity. Well, the nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States, resulting from an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. The reason why it's a strange form of occupation because under international law, you're not supposed to have created an entity like the state of Hawaii in occupied territory. The world should have known that you were doing it and would have stopped it. But because of the lies that have been instituted since the early 1900s, it went unnoticed. But he said, this is a strange form. You got an entity, not even a government, here created by American municipal law. Then he lays out the Hague and Geneva Conventions. As such, international laws, the Hague and Geneva Conventions, 
require that governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state, in this case the Hawaiian Kingdom, and not the domestic laws of the occupier, the United States. Dr. Desires did not come in with the Rosetta Stone and said, I just figured it out. All he's stating is what the law is, right? And that is powerful because it is so succinct and precise and to the point. He nails it. But because he is who he is, he knows how to speak that way, right? But he, he, he is an expert in this area, especially human rights. And when you talk about human rights, you're getting into war crimes. But he mentions the Hague and Geneva Convention. The violation of the Hague and Geneva Conventions, as I mentioned earlier, are war crimes. And remember, state of war. So here we have Amnesty International. There's a glossary on their website. Armed conflict. War crimes. Crimes that violate the laws or customs of war defined by the Geneva and Hague Conventions. So when he says you're supposed to administer the laws of the occupied state, he is also saying you haven't been administering the laws of the occupied state. Those are war crimes. And some of the terms that he uses in his letter, those are indications of crimes. He uses the word plundering. Plundering is pillaging. That's a violation of the Hague and Geneva Conventions. More correct would be codified as opposed to defined, yeah? Yeah, so codification, defined, same thing. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good example because the laws and customs of war existed since mid-1800s, but it has since been defined and codified by the Libra Code, the Hague Convention, the Geneva Convention. <clears throat> also, it has been uh, defined as war crimes under U.S. federal criminal law. So Title 18, Section 2441, which is what Jennifer was referring to, it says, an offense, whoever, whether inside or outside the United States, commits a war crime, shall be fined uh, and imprisoned not more than uh, for life or term of years, meaning it's more than one year, that's called a felony. A misdemeanor is less than a year. And definition, as used in this section, the term war crime means a grave breach of the Geneva Convention or the Hague Convention. Okay, so that's federal criminal law. So you see how we're, this history is now getting traction where the rubber hits the road. What you don't want to be is between the road and the rubber. <laughs> it's called step back. <laughs> and in the other part, I'm sorry, uh, Jennifer Ruggles was seeing the rubber coming close. She had to pull out of the way, right? And do what she's supposed to do under the Geneva Convention and protect protected persons. How you protect protected persons? educate them on what their rights are, and start talking. That's the first step. And that's what Jennifer and others are doing. Now what's also really cool as far as uh, education and exposure and how far reaching this information is, started, which started from an academic standpoint, it will continue to now to be out, an outgrowth of what is called the National Education Association, made up of public school teachers throughout America. Hawaii State Teachers Association is an affiliate union member of this organization and they meet every year to pass resolutions. So on July 4th of last year, 2017, this is on their Facebook, Hawaii State Teachers Association. Today the National Education Association's representative assembly meeting in Boston, Massachusetts approved new business item 37, quote, the NEA will publish an article that documents the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893, the prolonged illegal occupation of the United States in the Hawaiian Kingdom, and the harmful effects that this occupation has had on the Hawaiian people and resources of the land. That's pretty heavy. At that level, in Boston, and it was voted on by all other delegates representing other teachers in America. And they say mahalo to Chris Santamaro. This is Chris right here. He's a, uh, a teacher at Kanehohe Elementary who introduced the proposal in Uruhani Waiale Ale. This is Uruhani. Uh, teacher at Kualapu'u Charter School at Molokai, whose impassioned and articulate argument in favor of the Hawaiian overthrow measure swayed a majority of teachers from across the country to support it. First thing I did was I noticed a person here, right here, her name is uh, Amy Peruso. She's the secretary for the Hawaii State Teachers Association, but also a teacher of AP history at Nililani High School. She teaches about Hawaii's occupation. She also has a PhD in political science from UH. I called her, I said, first of all, congratulations. Second, how the hell did you guys do that? 
They said, yeah, I went to the committee. We just explained it. You know, when you just talk facts, it just went. I was like, wow, that is awesome. That is unbelievable. Then she said, but we need somebody to write the articles <laughs> for the NDA and not just tell them write it. Might be wrong, right? So we came to an understanding. Yeah, okay, you write them. Yeah, not a problem. <laughs> I'll write it. So, first article came out April 2nd, 2018. The illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the three levels. <laughs> For educators, they like that. Yeah. But you notice, I, what, can you notice something here in the title? What's important? What, what jumps out at you after we just talk? Yes, there was the government that was overthrown, not the country. Right on. You got an A. <laughs> and then the second article came out, October 1st, the U.S. occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And that's when I explained about legislation, limitation, you know, Senator Augustus Bacon saying, hey, you can't pass a law annexing a foreign country, blah, 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 and covers everything, you know. And then the third article, the impact of the U.S. occupation on the Hawaiian people. And I talk about Queen's Hospital and the educational system in the Hawaiian Kingdom and how it got hijacked and it affected the Hawaiian people, right, to where we are today. Uh, anybody who is uh, part of the National Education Union, which is about 3.2 million, or anybody who can go onto their website. Uh, so this is across America, this thing is spreading, right? What I also have in there is how it was the academics being done as far as research at the university that was uncovering this information. And that's what prompted them to change where it came out of. So if you notice these last two articles, it came out of students and social issues, races, uh, no, students and social issues. Okay, not racism. Students and social issues. Second one, students and social issues. Third one, educators in action. That's cool. <laughs> So they're acknowledging the educators at the university in taking action to getting this information out. Are you planning to write a fourth chapter saying, you know, the impact of US militarization? Well, this was, uh, this was because of this resolution. Right. Yeah. But we have articles that have been written on those issues that aren't just with the NEA, but part of our academic research as well. Yeah. So that's all out there. There's so much more that is being written. But I just want to point this out in the fact that this is America's largest union of, acad of, of school teachers. This is profound, and this should give you folks comfort in knowing this is not a radical thought. This is just a realization of, hey, this is what it is, and we're going to start teaching the right history. And a lot of them are using the book, Wamaukeel. In fact, when I asked uh, Amy Russo, what prompted the resolution to be passed? They said, your book. Because a lot of the teachers that are coming through the University of Hawaii are using that, are, are uh, students required to buy that book. It's recorded in my classes. So, again, this is our way to address denationalization. And we're going to do it the right way, within the institution itself. You know? We're not angry, we're not screaming, we're just saying, hey, here's a point, <laughs> here's a ramification. And there's no racial component, no cultural component. This is historical. That's how it is. But it allows history to be spoken of in its proper context. So, so the, the point that is being brought up here, if you folks haven't heard, is that there's so much military action taking place across Hawaii, across the island. How do we get people, somebody in charge to do something, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you know the first thing is don't do anything until you know what you're talking about. Know the language. I was in the army. I know the language. You start talking FM 27-10. You start talking hate convention, Article 43, and the impact of it. See, now you get their attention because you're talking their language. Right now, you're talking another language. You're talking about environmental impact statement. You're trying to argue about whether or not 
this is happening here. No, this is called destruction of property under Article 147 Geneva Convention. This is a war crime. Uh, did you know that? See, now that's, and that's to start a conversation. That's not to yell at anybody. And you know what they're gonna go, oh, this person is talking the right lingo. It's like in Germany, exactly, it's like in Germany talking about bases, I mean, talking about target ranges, and there is no agreement to be there. Well, either there is a stat no status of forces agreement, or if it's in Iraq during occupation, that could be a war crime. It depends on where you are, it's the context, it's the historical element. Well, that's just how to fix the problem right now. Well, I'm not going to assume he's going to do it or not. What I'm saying is if he does, then that's war crimes. See, the thing is, war crimes, there's no statute of limitation on it. No, there isn't. Because you know they're still hunting Nazis. No, I'm serious, but there's no statute of limitation on war crimes. The issue is not whether or not I'm going to be prosecuted for war crimes. The question is, have I committed a war crime? And what am I doing now to mitigate the situation? Because now my butt is in a, is in a vice. See, the only time people change is when they feel the pressure to change. Yeah, that's called turn up the heat. No, I, you know, because in my eyes, when I see what's going on in Hawaii, there are only two types of people. There are those that make decisions, and there are those that are affected by decisions made. Well, that's how it works. And those that are making decisions, actually, you're really not a decision maker. You're affected by decisions made. See, that's how you go to chain of command. Who's liable? Who's responsible? But before we start casting blame on anybody, Remember, other people didn't know what you folks just learned today, what makes them different, right? So these military people, they didn't know. But I tell you, they know the language. When you start hearing people start talking the right language, they're like, ooh, I think we might have a situation here where we need to understand. But that's an assumption that you're seeing which is self-defeating already. It's, it's saying, you know, nothing. If they're not going to do it anyway, so so why did you try? No, no, just say, I need to get educated on what's going on. I cannot come out with presuppositions and say what I think or what I suppose will happen. Because remember, you're operating from a false premise and you're just still learning a new language. So it's like trying to give a solution in Hawaiian when you still speak in English. you got to speak Hawaiian. Or at least you need to understand the Hawaiian to know what the solution is. must uphold the Hawaiians' culture and religion, and if they cause the Hawaiians to diminish, then Congress can shall... Okay, okay let, me, let me stop right there. Because, let me go back to the audience. She's referring to the Statehood Act of 1959. What is the Statehood Act of 1959? Municipal law. A municipal law. <laughs> limited to the United States. It doesn't matter what it says. It can even have a statement in passed by Congress saying, Keanu Sai is now King Commitment of 15. <laughs> it's still a municipal law. I might be treated like King Commitment of 15 when I land in Orange County or LA. Yeah, that's all good. But it's a municipal law of the United States, so it's a non issue. No. 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 It's an American law. And Article 43, so Article 43 of the Hague Convention, Article 64 of the Geneva Convention says you must administer the laws of the occupied state, not the Hawaiian Kingdom. I mean, sorry, not the United States. Statehood Act is an American law, period. It is a non-issue. It doesn't apply. The Apology Resolution of 1993 is a non-issue. It's an American law no matter what it says. Even with all its problems, it doesn't matter. It's not Hawaiian Kingdom law. So you need to know what is not only Hawaiian Kingdom law, you also have to know what is international law, the Hague Geneva Convention. And that's what Jennifer was doing, is educating people on what these laws are so that people know what their rights are. But this is a process, right? This is a process. So many people are at different stages of the learning curve, but there are consequences for this. So let me continue. We're gonna have more questions. Questions related to what I just covered or because we can get to the question after a presentation. I just, I got about three more slides. It's relating to, to what we were just talking about. Um, how does the monarchy be formed 
Hawaiian Kingdom or not, and how do they enforce the Hawaiian laws or change any of those Hawaiian laws? Remember, four stages of war. What is the first stage? Act of war. That happened on January 16, 1893, right? Second stage, occupation, belligerent occupation. When did that start? Next day, January 17th, when the queen yielded her authority. Remember when authority is given to the hostile power. That's occupation. Now, they didn't comply with the law of occupation since then, but it was belligerent occupation, right? Now, the third phase, okay? uh, no, act of war, Oh, no, 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 sorry, my bad. First stage, act of war, right? What is the second stage? It's not um, occupation. What's the second stage? Surrender. You gotta have a surrender, right? That transferred authority to the belligerent power. Just like the United States and Japan had a treaty of surrender in 1945. So you have a surrender, the queen surrendered, right? A conditional surrender. And it is, or whatever the case is. But the consequence of that is by saying, under the political question, this case is dismissed, it's only on jurisdiction. They actually accept as true all the allegations in the complaint. It's just this is the wrong venue. So it was a radical change on the political question doctrine that changed in 1962. So again, it's important to know the history of so many things to see it it changed, or actually what it was in 1800s. Because when that Senator Spooner said political question, he knew what it meant, but what was it meant in 1898? Not today. Well, it changed from 1898 till today. So the irony of 1962, Baker versus Carr, United States Supreme Court, here the political question would lock illegalities in the box. Here the new political question doctrine will give you the keys to open the box and open it up. Right? So, the petition for Ritterman Davis was filed in Washington, D.C., United States Federal District Court, on June 25, 2018. So, signed, Chairman of the Acting Council of the Regency of the Hawaiian Kingdom against Donald Trump and all these other countries and individuals. Now, on September 11, uh, well, actually before September, I was actually contacted by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C., asking for additional time to answer the complaint because if the way cases work you file a complaint if they don't answer within a time period they default that means you win the case that's how it works so the issue attorney was asking for additional time to respond because she wants to address whatever i said fine I, nobody can falsify this stuff this thing has gone through doctoral committees peer review law review okay we'll go through a u.s attorney now you found something <laughs> You found the treaty of annexation. That's the only way you can change this. <laughs> That's the only thing. You got a treaty? No treaty. Okay, everything is true. So, what ends up happening is the judge, the federal court judge, dismisses the case by an order right, on 9 11. Oh, what a day! 9 11. <laughs> dismisses the case and he says, because size claims involve a political question, this court is without jurisdiction to review his claims, and the court will therefore dismiss the petition. Ah. They're, they're only talking jurisdiction, so they can't review the claims. They actually accept the factual allegations as true. See, that's what I'm getting from it. But I need the court to tell me that, not me trying to say what I'm interpreting, right? Okay, so this is... What happened in 2008, the same court in Washington, D.C., dismissed the case concerning Taiwan as a political question under Rule 12b1 in Lynn versus United States. The federal court in its order stated that it must accept as true all factual allegations contained in the complaint when reviewing a motion to dismiss pursuant to Rule 12b1. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> that is the key that is pop, open the lock. Now everything comes up. So what are those factual allegations in the complaint that was accepted as true because they dismissed it as a political question? Right? The factual allegations were stated in paragraph 79 to 205 under the headings from a state of war to a state of state of peace to a state of war, the duty of neutrality by third states, 
obligation of the United States to administer Hawaiian Kingdom laws, denationalization through Americanization, the state of Hawaii is an armed force, the restoration of the Hawaiian Kingdom government, recognition de facto of the restored government, war crimes 1907 Hague Convention, and war crimes 1949 Geneva Convention. Under each of those headings is all the facts that speaks to these violations. So what they're saying is, well, the federal court can't look at it. The executive has to. Well, where does the executive go to? They go to international law. Uh, where were we in international law? <laughs> Permanent court of arbitration. Remember fact finding? Yeah, perfect. This is not a statement coming from the federal government admitting that everything here is true. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. It's just which court. Make sense? Now, what I find interesting is the U.S. Attorney in Washington, D.C. filed a motion, a request from this judge to allow her to answer the complaint in light of the order dismissing. Because the U.S. Attorney knows that by the judge dismissing it as a political question, she is admitting all the factual allegations are true. And she wants to try to <laughs> address it. And it was denied. So that means this can be now used at the UN Human Rights Council. It can be used in other cases. It can be, this is the US statement acknowledging Hawaii's occupied and war crimes have been committed. So the fact finding, what prompted the fact finding where this is gonna be used, right? Now, you guys remember, when you play these legal games, there are, there are traps that are there that you gotta be careful. I know these rules. I'm not a lawyer, but I know these rules. I'm a political scientist. And I work with attorneys. And this trap was set. And then on 9-11, <laughs> I didn't know how big the trap was and what we got. It took me a couple months to do my research because I knew right off the bat they're accepting everything that's true. And then I found Senator Spooner's statement and understood the doctrine back then, but it's changed today. And there's law journal articles on this that explains it. So we have access to a lot of these law journals. And I was like, whoa, this is big. Mahalo ke You know, this is going to be used the right way. So now the United States cannot say they never know. And that's what's important, this process. Yeah. So the fact finding, actually we're going to be initiating, we've initiated fact finding already. And it happened a couple years ago. And it started off with this, because we needed some indication that this information is, is gaining traction in the international community, right? Not just in Hawaii. And that happened at a case at the Permanent Court of Arbitration a couple years ago. And that was the South China Sea case. South China Sea case, China versus Philippines. No, sorry, Philippines versus China. You guys ever heard of the South China Sea case? Okay, this is when China is building islands in the South China Sea and they're putting military installations there. And the U.S. Pacific Fleet are sending ships in and it's like they're taunting. It's a flashpoint for possible war. That's what's going on there. South China Sea, uh, Philippines actually borders it, right? Now, you also have other countries that border the South China Sea. Vietnam, Burma, Indonesia, as well as China, okay? So, uh, the reason why Philippines got involved was because China began to build up an island within Philippines 200 mile radius called the EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone. That was in the Law of the Sea Convention. So it not only extended a 12 mile territorial sea, but also a 200 mile exclusive economic zone. Okay? So when they put, they started to build up an island within the Philippine, Philippines uh, EEZ, that's when they initiated a complaint with the Permanent Court of Arbitration for binding arbitration as a provision under uh, one of the annexes of the Law of the Sea Convention, where you have to go to arbitration, it's not a choice. So they initiated the case, Philippines versus China. And you notice they also identified Philippines as a state, China as a state, then they formed the tribunal. What came up initially was the indispensable third party rule. Remember that third party rule that you can't make a rule on something if another state is not there? So monetary rule, East Timor, that was referenced, well, these guys are going to have to deal with that. And when I heard that they were going to have to deal with the, East, the 
uh, the indispensable third party rule, when I read the judgment, I went, wow, I know there's only two monetary gold, they stay one. They deal with Albania and uh, Indonesia as absent states. What if they mentioned the Hawaiian Kingdom? You know, I just thought. And lo and behold, they did. In their arbitration award, paragraph 181, it says, The present situation is different from the few cases in which an international court or tribunal has declined to proceed due to the absence of an indispensable third party, namely monetary gold and East Timor before the International Court of Justice and Larson versus Hawaii Kingdom. That means we are now the third precedent case on indispensable third parties that will constantly be cited in international proceedings. That speaks to the uh, level of legalness of this case. It wasn't a political uh, hack, right? It was all procedural. And this case is about the Hawaiian Kingdom government, the Council of Regency, being sued by a Hawaiian subject. And the indispensable, par indispensable party is the, United, is the United States. So it says here in the decision, in all of those cases, the rights of third states respectively Albania, Indonesia, and the United States would not only have been affected by a decision in the case, but would have formed the very subject matter of the decision. Additionally, in those cases, the lawfulness of activities by third states was in question, whereas here, none of the Philippines' claims entail allegations of unlawful conduct by Vietnam or other third states such as Burma and Indonesia, also bordering, right? The fact is, <clears throat> they cited the Hawaiian Kingdom, the Larson case. That's important. That's very important. To me, that was a sign. Let's move for fact finding. Let's get that moving. So, under the Permanent Court of Arbitration, they have what is called fact finding right here. Commissions of inquiry. Up to date, there's only been five of them between two states. We're going to be the six between a state and a private party. And the issues that can be that will be taken up. The facts admitted to by the United States in the mandamus. Then we move into Lance Larson. Then we move into accountability. So, uh, a notice was given to the Permanent Court of Arbitration initiating the process back in August of 2016. International Commission of Inquiry will be comprised of three commissioners appointed by the Permanent Court of Arbitration. First, they will determine what is the function and role of the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom in accordance with the basic norm and framework of international humanitarian law, which is the law of occupation. So we're saying, tell us. I'm not going to try to get opinions from people. You're the authority? Tell us. What's our role? In light of all these violations and people getting hurt, all that. Second, what are the duties and obligations of the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom toward Lance Larson and by extension toward all Hawaiian subjects residing in Hawaii and abroad? Okay, let the experts tell us. And third, because people in Hawaii are not just Hawaiian subjects, right? Who's in Hawaii? <laughs> aliens. But aliens are, what? Protected persons under the Geneva Convention. Third, what are the duties and obligations of the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom toward protected persons who are domiciled or resident in Hawaiian territory? And those, protection, those protected persons who are transient, tourists, in accordance with the basic norms and framework of international humanitarian law. On my legal team, I have a, <clears throat> a former UN official from the Human Rights Council, uh, Ben Emerson from Matrix Chambers in London. He came on as my legal counsel. My deputy agent is Professor Federico Lanzarini from the University of Siena in Italy, background is international law. And uh, Dexter Kayama is representing Lance Larson in these proceedings. So, Remember the money? Yeah, I do. You gotta raise money. Alright. 150,000 was the last arbitration. Well, we told Lance, we're gonna cover the cost now, not you. So we gotta get money. Now, how do you get money? How does a government get money? Normally, a government gets money through taxation, right? Uh, leasing on public property, right? Or government bonds. Government bonds. Bonds. Government bonds are loans to a government. It's not money. It's a loan to the government. And if you have heard of treasury bonds, a lot of local people, when, like in the 1960s, a couple of my, I think my tutu bought a, a $25 treasury bond. 
and I could. And what you do is the treasury bond is you buy it at face value, but there's an interest rate where you can redeem it after so many years. So like after 30 years, you can redeem the, the, the bond by getting the face value back and the interest on it. And it's all stated there, right? So that's why it's a loan to a government. Now, for the acting government, we can't collect taxes by taxation because we're not in effective control, right? Yeah. Uh, well, that's only coming after the occupation. But then that's going to be moving toward a permanent government, which may not be me and the people involved, but people that have been elected. And that's when the process really begins. Uh, we can't collect any leases from government lands because we're not in control of government lands, crowning government lands. So the only way that we could get is through bonds. So we had to look into the Hawaiian Kingdom whether it had bonds. So this is a bond from the Hawaiian Kingdom era for $3. And six month interest bond. Okay? So what happens is when you purchase this bond, when it when there's a time to redeem it, let's say five years, ten years, fifteen years, whatever it is, you would get the three dollars back plus the interest on it. Okay. So so we already know that the Hawaiian Kingdom had bonds. And it's actually in the statute under Hawaiian Kingdom municipal law. So we know that we're authorized to issue bonds. So we have now a template to use and also the laws to follow in doing it. But we needed to find an example of a situation similar to ours. Some type of war situation, some kind of, because how do you, how can we effectively put a time limit on a redemption? How do you put a time limit on a redemption? Because if I say in 10 years, where's that money gonna come from in 10 years, right? So there has to be what is called a conditional redemption on the face of the bond meaning a contingent uh, uh, some situation that would kick start it that would say okay now a fixed time will come and you can redeem it right so we need to find something similar to that and guess where we found that from our due diligence ireland 1920s ireland was fighting for their independence from britain rebelling did you know that the Irish Republic was an insurgency fighting for their independence? They were in America selling Irish bonds to Irish Americans to support the homeland to break away from Great Britain. So they're selling these bonds, $25 bonds. $25 today is almost like 100 something, right? Inflation calculator. But it's here that has what is called the condition of redemption. Because what if Ireland doesn't win the war? Right? Because right? what you're doing is you're actually funding yeah, yeah. Ireland to fight. An it's an investment in your country that you want to become an independent state. So in the condition, in the writing, it says said bond to bear interest at 5% per annum for the first day of the seventh month after the freeing of the territory of the Republic of Ireland from Britain's military control and set bond to be redeemed at par within one year thereafter. Nice. That means after Ireland becomes an independent state. You want to your mind. Exactly. That's how it works. But you gotta make sure Ireland is independent. So you're investing in the in the hope that they win the war. Right. So really this bond is an investment in the future of Ireland as a country. Now for us, we don't need to do that. Because we're already a country. We just have to have something that applies to our situation. So, what we learned from the Irish. So here we have the Hawaiian Kingdom bond. And there, we have said bond to bear interest at two and one half percent per annum from the date the American occupation comes to an end that the Hawaiian go and that the Hawaiian government is in complete control in the exercising of its sovereignty. Because by five, with five years after we're in control of our sovereignty, exercising authority, see that's when we can get our reparations, we can fill the coffers. Did you know that um, the Iraqis for seven and a half months of occupation with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990, reparations for violating the Hague Geneva Conventions came up to $56 billion for seven and a half months of illegal occupation. $56 billion. Just you take that amount 
can theoretically apply to Hawaii for 125 years, you come on with 11 trillion. 11 trillion. And the rent past the And properties can be vested within the Hawaiian kingdom because Iraqi assets were vested throughout the world, frozen and liquidated to pay off the reparations for violations of the law of occupation. So you see these mechanisms are all there, but we have to make sure that when the bond is issued, we got to make sure that that redemption time is something that is practical and, and, and real, right? So that's what it is. And then some of you folks uh, have seen applications. So Kanaka Council is not selling bonds. I just allow them to let out the applications because we kept it under the radar for quite some time because some sovereignty activists have been using bonds as if it's money. No, it's not money, it's a loan. And these are non-exchangeable, just like all government bonds are. It goes to the name of the entity that is put on the bond itself or their heir or successor to be redeemed. So we have this in the frequently asked questions. You folks can get that in the back. Okay. And thank you. Ooh, that was a long one. <laughs> information to be thrown into all of this but what I wanted to do was to top it off from what you folks have already learned yeah and just take it up to another level question brother okay. no problem yeah. so it comes with a it's sealed it's all verifiable and actually uh, let you guys know this I'm gonna be honest with you uh, last year, we were contacted by the um, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs uh, Securities Enforcement Division. Business bonds, commercial bonds, right? Uh, they said that they were referred by the Attorney General about these bonds and uh, were under investigation for fraud. Yeah. So when I was in contact with the investigator, I said, oh no, these are not commercial bonds, these are government bonds. Uh, you can go to the Permanent Court of Arbitration and actually see who we really are. And this is what we can do under our municipal laws, and this has nothing to do with you, but in a respectful way, because I was kind of educated, right? So then, uh, just got a letter the other day, the investigation has been complete, and uh, it's all done. By the way, the whole is bitch bonds. So that's an example of, I'm not trying to argue with you what this is, I'm just explaining it to you, and it should be self-evident. If you want to buy the bonds, you invest in your country. If you don't want to buy the bonds, not a problem. <laughs> so I'm not here to sell it, I'm just saying if you want to invest in your country, hey, do, if the Irish could do it for their country, I think we can do it for ours. And this is open to not just Hawaiian subjects, it's anybody, and I can tell you, the majority of the bonds that have been purchased, because we got to travel a lot. I've been traveling to Europe a lot to meet up with a lot of people. And, you know, prior to the bonds, guess where that money was coming out of? That's right, my own pocket. You know, when I went back to UH to continue our education to expose as part of the, as a government policy, acting government. Uh, it's not like the acting government could pay for my tuition, right? Yeah, guess what? I'm still paying my uh, student loans back. Yeah, it's over 30000 But that's just what, it, that's just what we got to do. Right. The investment in yourself or the education you need to see where you travel. Exactly. And, and you know what the thing is, it's called Kuliana. I started this, I'm going to finish it. And the people that I work with, we all finish it. And, and so a lot of people... Uh, <laughs> I've been always asked in the past, what can I do? How can I help? I've always heard that. I said, get educated. Read this, talk to, your, talk to people. I've always kept this under the radar. Because I have this hat on that I do when I need to do it. But nobody knows. See, I have a, I have a saying, I don't tell people I'm going fishing. Otherwise the fish go here and swim away. I said, uh, I go in holo But when I come back with the poke, you know exactly what kind of fish I got. And there's only certain places get this kind of fish, like the Hague, <laughs> uh, Geneva, Switzerland, Zurich. <laughs> they get good tasting fish over there, you know. You don't have to eat ahi all the time. 
But this now is a way for people to help. And you know what? Nobody knows who bought the bonds. It's all confidential. And all you do is follow the instructions on the application, put them in the mail. And then it goes that route. Yes? Oh, actually, yes, other country, uh, yes, other nationals of other countries have already purchased bonds. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of people are buying bonds for their children. Sure. Um, anybody can buy bonds because it's a private contract and it's just a loan to the government. The main thing is we got to make sure that it can be redeemed. Uh, and so we could be held liable for fraud if that doesn't take place. So we have to be careful how these things are played out. Yeah. And then, and then. Aloha. Yeah, Thank you so much uh, for coming today and continuing this education process. The question I have is, um, it's very relevant for those of us who know America's true status as well as what happened here with the state of Hawaii. And America, officially, by its own definition, is a federal corporation. It's not a de jure government. And that occurred in 1871 with the creation of the District of Columbia. So some of us are really concerned um, if we're going to have a military government, that this will be the military arm of a federal corporation. No, it's not. It's the so, state of Hawaii. Okay, but the state of Hawaii also has a Dun & Bradstreet number. So it is a corporation with its parent corporation in D.C. It's really just Article 1 of the G.K. Convention. It's an armed force. Okay, it's an armed force. My concern is because by United States Code Article 28, Section 3. But well, that's municipal law that applies to the United States, not here. But the state of Hawaii is part... Well, the United States was being by municipal law. That's why they're not a government. They're an armed force. Okay, so, but it is a corporation. United States. It's whatever they call themselves, it's an armed force. They, they do call themselves... They're not calling themselves an armed force. No, they, say, they do call the definition of corporation. The definition is under Article 1 of the Hague Convention. So my, my concern is this. Whatever they call themselves, they're operating in Roman civil law. They're not operating as an actual de jure government. It's a government services corporation. What's question? Yes, my question is... How does the acting government address the issue that the military is actually the military armed force arm of a privately owned corporation? It is not a de jure yeah, government. I'm not, I'm not getting into the terms you're talking about. I'm talking about an armed force as defined by the Hague Convention, Article 1. These issues are part of the issues that are going to be brought before the Fact-Finding Commission of Inquiry, who are experts in the area to explain these things on what is the next step. Okay, so how do we guarantee, as the acting Hawaiian Kingdom government, how do we guarantee full disclosure and substantive due process when we're dealing with a corporation that makes its own laws, that is not so, actually accountable... Okay, let me answer the question. Yes, sir. So what I'm saying is, there's a lot of things that you don't want until I tell you folks. Right? I didn't start off by explaining we're, we're, we're going to the Hague because we're going to do this. It's because there are certain rules, certain things that you follow, and this is the outcome that leads to another outcome that leads to another outcome. So there's a lot of things that are taking place here, which is part of education. But there are a lot of things that I don't say because there are things in motion. That's just the way it works. No. So the first thing is just get educated. Just start to understand what is the Hague Convention? What is Article 1? Uh, start reading some of these articles that we're all putting out in the academic world that have already been peer-reviewed, law-reviewed. It's not argumentative stuff. You know, this is really just a matter of falsifying information because these are legal issues that have profound ramifications. So you don't find it relevant that we are actually dealing with a privately owned and controlled... What I'm telling you is that there are things in operation that you don't know what's going on. Well, I do know that they are a... Okay, so if that's your point or your position, that's fine. <laughs> no, I'm not going to we, how, Why would we accept the military I'm not asking arm? You to, I'm, not asking, I'm not asking anybody here to accept. I'm not arguing with you to accept. I'm very government. grateful for the work you've done, sir. It's a very relevant question because we're not dealing with a digital government, whether it's the state of Hawaii or the U.S. federal corporation. There are certain assumptions that you're saying that I can falsify already, but that's not the place for it. So what I'd like to do is get to other questions with regard to the presentation. And You're saying that my claim 
decision. That the United States is not a corporation. You're saying that it is a de jure government? Yeah, I'm saying it's a government. You're saying it's a de jure government? Yeah, it is. Not a government services <coughs> corporation. Where well, it's is a body your, politic. Where is your you Go take classes up in political science I'm and done. learn the basic stuff about okay, government okay. and corporate I'm entities. Done. I'm done. You know, that's all it is. You so can call the United it. States Code yourself, Article 28, that's fine. That's fine. Section 3002, Line 15, the definition of the United States. What is a corporation? Yeah, a corporation is a legal entity. It was created by and owned by somebody. Okay. So, can yeah, we move thank on? Thank you. Yeah, we can move on. So, do you have a question back there? Yes, in this um, government bond, kingdom yeah. bond. Okay. Yeah. Who's or where is the money going to be secured from all of these bonds? What's your name? Well, the monies are secured, and they've been secured since 2014, which has allowed us to do what we're doing. The main thing is when the bonds are issued, it is the contract between the acting government and the person who bought it, and when that redemption can be done for redeeming the bond. So my question is, where is that money being secured? Within a bank account. Because that's how we gotta use it if we're traveling around the world and buying bank tickets. In the application, does it state the bank? Well, let me just say that, you know, I'm not here to tell you guys to buy bonds, and if you have questions about it and you're, you're concerned, I can actually tell you don't buy it, just let it go. I'm just sharing with you what is going on as far as how we are able to do what we're doing, right? And as long as this is understood to be a contract between the person who purchased it and the one who received it, the entity, and the obligations that are there to ensure the redemption can be done is the key. That's the issue. Yeah. What is that? No, okay. <laughs> but, you know, so, uh, what, what do I want? Okay. Yes. One comment, one question. The comment that I have is about the Americanization of the children. Right. That playbook was taken directly. What happened to my ancestors as part of the church? Yeah, no, exactly. They call it assimilation. They just changed that yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. But, but the plan is like down the line. I agree. Thing. Actually, the Germans, denationalization, Germanization, actually looks very similar to what America was doing to the Native Americans. No, no, actually, and and uh, actually, the Ku Klux Klan has that statement: uh, "One country, one flag, one language." That's actually on some of the Ku Klux Klan's uh, uh, emblems. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, they might so this is a good point. So did anybody, did you folks hear what she said? Okay. So this is what was shared. Okay. So title insurance. So she's referring to what Jennifer was re uh, speaking to title insurance through escrow, right? And she said, well, there's the insurance, but what about the land and the holdings of the land? How does that come into play? And this is where I can further explain that. Okay. So this is how land title transactions occurred in the kingdom as it also occurs in the United States and other countries where titles are being transferred. They okay, call fee simple titles. Okay, so whenever you have a transfer of title, what you have before the transfer of title is called a bill of sale. Okay, a bill of sale is whatever the price of that property is, and that person is saying, hey, I'm gonna sell this property for $10,000 out in Puna somewhere, and that's a bill of sale. And when the person provides that person with $10,000, whether uh, by a loan from the bank or in cash, then that leads to the second step, which is for that person who owns the property to transfer a legal title. And that's called a warranty deed or a quick claim deed, whatever the deed is, depending on what interest you have, right? Now, in order to transfer the deed between a grantor and a grantee, you need to get it notarized, right? That is a requirement under Hawaiian municipal law since 1845. That's when the Bureau of Conveyances was established. That's when notaries were established, 1845, called the Organic Acts of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So when you convey a piece of property to transfer legal title, you got it notarized, get it notarized, then you record it in the Bureau. Once it's recorded, legal title transfers. 
Okay, but that process doesn't take place until the bill of sale is complete. Right? Valuable consideration has to be exchanged, whether a dollar in love or ten thousand dollars, whatever the case may be. What we have here as a problem is from 1893, there have been no notaries that were valid to notarize the deeds. These notaries started off with insurgents, called Samuel Damon and Sanford Dolan. They couldn't notarize anything if they're insurgents. So that means that the person in 1895 that purchased the property, exchanged valuable consideration, he was not able to get a legal transfer because of a defect. That doesn't mean he doesn't have an equitable interest in the property, he just got to fix the title. Okay? So these are two separate things. So now as we come up till today, the person who buys property today, let's say I'm in, I'm on, I'm in Kaloli, yeah? I buy a property on 32nd Street, 10,000 square feet uh, piece of property. I have to get it notarized, right? After the bill of sale is done. Now, before I get it notarized, or no, let me back up. Let's say I don't have in cash $10,000 to pay for the bill of sale. I gotta borrow $10,000, so I gotta go to a bank. When I go to a bank to borrow $10,000, the bank wants to loan you $10,000 because they're gonna make money off of you with the interest, whether 15 years or 30 years, right? There's an interest that you, they're gonna get. But before they, they uh, loan you the money to buy the property, they have to make sure that they need something of collateral, something that they can hold on to, to ensure the repayment of the loan, right? So normally what you do is mortgage your property to the bank to hold on to, and that mortgage, that term, is not a loan. A lot of people think a mortgage is a loan. No, it's not. A mortgage is collateral. It's a security instrument that the bank holds on to. The loan is the promissory note that you sign. Okay, that's a separate document. Now, before the bank accepts your mortgage as collateral, which allows them to foreclose on the property if you default on the loan, let's say you don't pay it after 10 years because you lost your job, they can actually, and authorized to do it by you, to take your property and sell it and make up the money owed to them. And any excess money, will, they'll give back to you. And you authorize the foreclosure in the mortgage agreement, right? So before the bank can accept the mortgage as collateral, which they may have to sell the property on your behalf to cover the debt, they gotta make sure you own the land. They gotta make sure you got your title. So what they so what they do is they require you to go to escrow. So let's say you go to title guarantee. So title guarantee is an escrow company that does a title search on your property. And if they find in the title search that goes back to 1845, there's no defect. But they really are, huh? 1893. That's a big red light right there. Who's the notary? But they just kind of oh, just kind of ignore that. But what they do is they say, oh, title's good. They tell the bank, title's good. But the bank says, no, I'm not looking at what your opinion is. I need you to put your money where your mouth is. And that's when title insurance comes in. So people working at the escrow companies come from insurance companies in America, like Chicago Title Insurance Company, Stewart Title Insurance Company, Tycor Title Insurance Company. Title guarantee is escrow. It's not an insurance company. They just do title search. These people called underwriters from, let's say, Chicago Title will take the title report and issue a title insurance policy that ensures the accuracy of the title search. That's what it does. So if you borrow $10,000, you're going to purchase a title insurance policy to protect the bank for $10,000. That's how it works. And what they're doing is they're ensuring the accuracy of the search. Because if the search is inaccurate and there's a defect, meaning the title company missed the notary, that policy is activated. Because a defective notary is a covered risk in the insurance policy when you read it. It says, so because there are defective notaries since 1893, <clears throat> title insurance is supposed to be paying off everybody's loan because you guys all bought title insurance policy. And for some of you, you may have not just purchased a lender's policy to protect the bank. You may, have protect, you may have purchased an owner's policy to protect you, but you won't know that unless you look at your HUD-1 statement, which is our closing costs in your escrow papers. And you will find in section 1109 and section 1110, I know this quite well. It'll show whether or not 
If you have a mortgage, you have, you have a lender's policy that protects the bank. But not everyone may have an owner's policy. You might have to go back to your original escrow papers and you bought it the first time and you didn't even know you bought it. Now, an owner's policy actually protects the owner at a fixed amount. Let's say the appraised value of the property the time you took out the policy was $300,000. When you do a loan policy, it's only covering the debt owed to the bank. So as you pay off the loan, the coverage of the lender's policy is shrinking because it's only covering the debt. But your owner's policy is covering the fixed value. That's why you can look at your policy and see what it says. Now, all of these things are there as far as your rights that you didn't even know you had. And that's why it's important to know what is going on with Hawaii's history, but also how you can benefit from the fact that you got a contract that actually pays off the loan. That's why Jennifer sent that letter off to all the judges and said nobody should even be in foreclosure because everybody has a defect in title and every policy should be activated, period. That's another aspect of how this information is permeated. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, um, there is a colleague actually has been in communication with Chicago Title Insurance Company, and he filed a claim under his owner's policy, and they are getting caught. Uh, one of the statements says, well, until the state of Hawaii recognizes the Hawaiian kingdom, we're not going to pay off the policy. Well, now with this information that's coming out, the state of Hawaii is actually an armed force. The UN official already said the Hawaiian kingdom exists. I think you should pay off the policy. What they're doing is they're they're trying to stop the the, the the dam from breaking. Yeah. But see, as people are trying to break the stop the dam from breaking, they're committing war crimes against people because now they're being thrown into foreclosures and being pillaged and taken off their property. See, that's where it's getting a big problem. No. No. What? Yeah, you need a well acting government cannot provide notaries right now. I mean this is a See, we're not in effective control, we're exposing. Now, you guys gotta remember, this is a stage of education. This is a very complex and huge problem. And it has to be done with surgical understanding and uh, being precise. It's not like, hey, I'm gonna try something, I hope it works. That thing would just blow up in your face. So there's a lot of a lot of things here that, that we've been doing that I have to keep under the radar until you folks are ready to understand it, but education is important. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this question. I'm glad somebody who was affected by the lava is here. Okay, did you have a mortgage on the property before the, it was taken? Um, did you ever go to escrow? Okay, I would go back and check your escrow papers to see if you have a owner's policy in section 1110, no, 11, 1110, in your HUD-1 statement. Because once you have that, you have a means to file a claim with the insurance company under your owner's policy for a defective mortgage. Well, what's starting to happen is people are starting to realize that nobody can buy property because they're all defective. Right. Yeah. Well, I would just say make sure you got title insurance. <laughs> but then also, no, but see, now also there's a catch 22 here. Because if you read the policy of the title insurance, it says that if you know that there was a defect, that is a means by which they don't have to carry out the policy. So that's like a catch 22. Municipal law. 
nobody can transfer property because of the law of occupation. I mean, every entity in Hawaii since 1893 has been locked. And right now, we're coming to that realization of seeing it being, it being locked all these years. The question is how do you fix the problem? And that's what we're dealing with and working with at the university through research in providing a transitional plan on how to fix the problem. And that was reflected in my meetings with Mike McCartney, um, Governor Eby. That was not just me sitting there giving him my manao. I'm telling him, this has already been researched, it's done, and it's what you gotta do. And if you don't do it, you're committing war crimes. So that's just the way it goes. But what people do is they think, ah, nobody knows. America would never let this happen. But that's what Nazis were saying in 1942 until 1945 came in the Nuremberg trials. So we have to be careful how we play this game. But right now, what you folks are here for is education. And that's why the university people were here. This is my peer group as well. And what I shared with you is how you actually apply it. But today it wasn't about what we do. I'm just sharing with you what we did. Because <laughs> remember, I'm only going holo holo. <laughs> and when I come back, then I'll tell you again what I did <laughs> and not what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, I want to... One more question. Okay. Why um, Kingdom license plate on that car? Yeah. Money's from that no. goes to no. supporting the Hawaiian government? No. There is no municipal law under Hawaiian law for, for license plates. Right? Yeah, 1893, there were no automobiles, so there were no license plates. So, Hawaiian municipal law doesn't have license plates. So, people paying the money to that license plate, whoever's dealing it in Hilo, don't trust. I don't, I'm just saying people need to be aware and educated of what's going on. The first thing is education to understand what's happening. So, I'm not, there are a lot of things out there that that going on. People believe the state of Hawaii exists, people vote, people attend the Democratic Party, you know, the whole thing's illegal. <laughs> I mean, it really boils down to it's all illegal. But I still got my cousin who still is working as a police officer. My son is a police officer. My point is how, we, how do we fix that? How do we provide a transition? Because the police department is from the Kingdom of Right. Fire department from the Kingdom of See, and that's all part of the, the process, right? So I'm not here to try to pick and choose on who is what and who is not. All I can tell you is who am I and this is what we do. That's the bottom line. And with that, mahalo for everybody for being here. Yeah. Again, everybody, mahalo for all of you hanging there and staying all the way through. And for those of you that are wanting to hunt a home, you can go up to Black Rock Inn and have a couple up there to go to our home. But as far as everything here, mahalo for coming. And let everybody else know, you know, about future conferences and please come to the next conference, which is going to be July 31st, La Hoi Hoi Ea, the Hawaii Kingdom Restoration. That's next year. Mahalo, everybody. Great